So without further ado, I want to introduce Mr. Spurgeon Dunbar and Zach Kortz. Let's get it going. Thank you, too. Everybody, look at you. You made it. Good for you. My name is Zach Kortz. This is Spurgeon Dunbar. Welcome to the historic Frida Cinema here in downtown Santa Ana, California for the first ever edition of High Side, Low Side Live. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you guys for making it out on a Friday night. Um, this means a lot to us. Uh, the fact that you're here is why we can do this. We've got a great program in store for you. Uh, we have Jen Dunstan, who's going to be joining us for a segment on some, some fun news topics. And then as we discuss different eras of motorcycling, we're going to bring up Mr. Ari Henning. Now, there was some confusion. I was talking to somebody in the audience, and they thought that I said uh, errors in motorcycling. That's arguably an entire other that's podcast. A great idea. So that's not what we're talking about. That's a great Eras. idea. Send us an email, please. Yeah. <laughs> Highside, lowside at Rosilla.com. So we don't forget. That's a great idea. But we're going to jump into some uh, some reviews first from Apple Podcasts. Right. And we're going to give away some t-shirts. Those of you familiar with the program know that um, we like to pick the most glowing and positive reviews where people tell us we're good looking, stuff like that. Um, Intelligent. And, right, exactly. And, uh, and read those aloud on our podcast and then give that person a t-shirt. So we have reached that part of the program. Welcome. So for those of you that are new, you're watching at home, uh, <laughs> what we ask for you is that you subscribe, you listen, and then leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That's where it makes the most difference for us. The first winner of the day is Fred Spagoo, who said... Sp hang on, hang on. Is Fred Spagoo here, any chance? Raise your hand for Fred Spagoo. Yeah, so we didn't... No, that, no, was, that was a no, long no, shot. No, I know, no. I just All had right. to... <laughs> Fritz Magoo says, love the podcast, keep it up, can I be a guest? I have a lot of opinions. <laughs> we, we really applaud Fred for asking this question because, you know, why not? T took a shot in the dark. Um, so the, the answer, Fred, <clears throat> is no, you may not be a guest on the podcast. <laughs> however, however, uh, please do send your uh, t-shirt size and mailing address to High side, low side at revzilla.com. Uh, we will send you a t-shirt, and hopefully when you wear that t-shirt, it will start conversations and you can give people your opinion. I'm gonna let you do, yeah. So uh, that's how this works. Um, I'm gonna let you take the next one because it just makes the most sense. I agree, okay. Winner number two goes by the name of Bill Fred. Bill Fred, perhaps that's his name. You pronounced it correctly, Bill, Bill Fred. Fred. The subject was Vstrom, Vstrom, Vstrom. And it reads, now that I've got your dad's attention, Spurgeon. I'm going to stop you for one second. I don't know who has the bright yellow V-Strom outside, but it's parked in He's between here. Here. two KTMs. <laughs> yeah, it's so that was very appropriate. Yeah, nice. I like that. There are a lot of V-Strom's here. Yeah, <laughs> Spurgeon's dad would be very happy. Uh, Billford says, and I quote, I'm listening to season four, episode 11, while my girlfriend is asleep in the truck. We put a lot of girlfriends to sleep, I'm sure. <laughs> she suddenly wakes up and says, what's that guy's name? Spurgeon Dunbar, and he's from Allentown, Pennsylvania. I think my mom went to high school with Spurgeon Dunbar. So Billford goes on to say, a few texts later, we find out that her mom, Carol Meitzler, went to elementary and high school with Spurgeon Sr. This, this is like you the can't make thing. this up. You can't, you can't write this stuff. Well, Billford can. Anyway, we we <laughs> called we called uh, Spurgeon's dad and uh, literally what, like yesterday. yesterday. Like this was this all took place when we were digging through this less than 24 hours ago. And producer Chase was wise enough to record the conversation where we asked uh, Spurgeon Senior by Spurgeon Junior what actually happened with Carol Meitzler. So you know, so you know Carol Meitzler. Sure, sure. Did you, did you date Carol Meitzler or just like no, friends with her? No, not really. Um, uh, actually, Spurgeon, I think, used to hang around with Carol's younger sister. Carol was my age in school, and we were always friendly. And just to be and, clear for everybody else listening, Spurgeon is your sister. Right, right. Cool. So now they're. Now I just heard everybody's mouth hit the floor. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we just thought, we, we, we heard this comment, we were like, it was just funny because well, cool. apparently... You know, Carol Meitzler still refers to you to the point where her daughter was driving in a pickup truck and she recognized the name. So, there anyway. you go. See, motorcycles tie us all together. Yeah. 
There you go. And if it hadn't been for a V-Strom, it never would have happened. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what it is. It's all the V-Strom's fault. <laughs> Talk to you later, bud. Love, Love you. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Spurgeon Sr., everybody. So, there you go. Um, yeah, for anybody that Spurgeon doubts Sr. how this works, literally, my dad listens to the podcast, and anytime Zach mentions a, a V-Strom, I get a phone call being like, see, Zach Quartz like a V-Strom. You, you, you should like one, too. And it's a lovely bike. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> really picking on yours. Um, but, yeah, so... If you are Carol Meitzler, if you are the daughter of Carol Meitzler, if you're the boyfriend of the daughter of Carol Meitzler, you're all getting T-shirts. Um, so write in to HighSideLowSide at RevZilla.com. And uh, I guess any other past girlfriends of my dad from high school <laughs> will give you a T-shirt too. So uh, send us an email. That was my favorite part was, did you date her? Not really. Not really. Not really. Not really. Yeah. Exactly. Obviously very memorable, as Spurgeon says. Because Define date in the 70s, Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. What it was, uh, it was uh, a <laughs> summer of love. Okay. So we've given, we've given away two T-shirts now to Fred Spagoo and Bill Fred. And once again, please uh, send your... Uh, Preferred sizing and mailing address to highside, lowside at revzilla.com. Yeah, there seems to be some confusion of that too. So if you're <laughs> if you're listening, um, you have to send us the email letting us know that you won. <laughs> Otherwise, we can't send you a t-shirt. We Sizes don't know where you and live. addresses help too. So <laughs> we don't know where you live. Yeah. I mean, maybe we do. Shh. Okay, dokie. So t-shirts are given away. At this point, we'd like to jump into uh, a little segment we call the news. The news. Yeah, we came up with that ourselves. Pretty good, right? Um, <laughs> And for that, our lovely colleague, Jen Dunson, will be joining us. So please, give a round of applause for Jen Dunson, everybody. Don't let me hang. Okay, thank you. For what it's worth, uh, we were told we weren't allowed to stand uh, and be gentlemanly when she came on the stage because the camera cuts us off. Because, so. because we are simply huge, and uh, Spurgeon's head is also very large. Yeah. So, so anyway, welcome <laughs> is the Why, point. Why, thank you. <laughs> Um, so we have a list of topics here to talk about. I want to tell everyone that she has no idea what they are, but she does. She knows what it is. So hopefully <laughs> she's prepared. First thing we want to talk about is um, a little known Italian man who uh, had a racing career named Valentino Rossi. He retired from racing. And we know that you have strong feelings about MotoGP, motorcycle competition in general. So we want you to reflect on, on the Rossi career. How do you feel about that? I literally had tears in my eyes oh. at the end of that race. I didn't think I would get that emotional about, you know, someone <laughs> you don't really know and get to meet, but that's like, that's Rossi. He you feel has, like you know him. You do, right? yeah. And between him and Nikki Hayden, like that's how I got an MoGP. Like those two personalities, like they made the racing come alive. They made you care, especially in films like, you know, um, uh, what was it? The Doctor, the Texas right. Tornado. Faster. Y yeah. Sure, sure. Faster was it for me. That was that was the pivotal. That's actually the last MoGP race you watched. I think was a documentary that came out in 2002. <laughs> I mean, you're not you're not far from it. Because <laughs> I usually just drink my way through Austin. So it's yeah. I usually don't actually pay attention to the racing. Um, no, I, I think one of the things that he had said uh, when he was doing the final press conference was, you know, his biggest achievement wasn't the winning, but it was rather the influence on MotoGP and, the, you know, getting more people to, to watch the sport. And I was easily one of those people. You know, I, I didn't really watch MotoGP before him. And, and he was someone that, like, all of our friends kind of gravitated towards him, you know, for when we showed up at back when the races were at Indy and then, you know, down in Texas. We just won't tell him that even after he was racing, you still didn't watch. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Love to hate Spurgeon's uh, mediocre fandom of it's MotoGP. Like, it's like medium, well, medium. I think I know the answer to this question, Jen, but you will probably keep watching MotoGP, even Sans Rossi. Uh, yeah, most definitely. Obviously. <laughs> Is, who, who, who's, your, who's the next person that you're rooting for other than Rossi? Um... I mean, I actually do like Quadraro, and I'm glad he won okay. this year, Word. so props sure. to him. Mini Rossi. Oh, a little round and of applause. I like Benyaya, sure, too. I like it. Come on, Ducati fans. Benyaya, he's pretty sweet, so. Agreed. Agreed, agreed. Smaller round of applause for Benyaya. <laughs> um, and the, the, I guess, I suppose the other thing we wanted to talk to you about regarding MotoGP, Mark Marquez's eyeball. Maybe both of them? It's no, just it's just one. It's not it's good one. right now. Right, right. Yeah. Bad news. If, for those of you who don't know, Mark Marquez had an eye injury just before he got to MotoGP. Or he, you know, almost didn't, almost ended his career. 2011, I believe. Something like that, 2012. Something like that. Yeah, anyway. Um, but I know you're also a fan, and you're sort of like rooting for him to come back. Are you not? I am. I I have a love-hate relationship with Marquez, because I like appreciate his passion. Because you actually know him. <laughs> I feel like you love and hate a lot of people. <laughs> oh, here it goes. Us. Oh, my God. That's a, that's a whole other podcast, yeah, Rich. Yeah. Nice. Um, <laughs> nice. 
Nailed it. No, but like uh, Marquez has such a tenacity, and we see it on the track. And I think you can't discount him, even with all these injuries he's been through. Um, he's 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 so passionate. He has such intensity about him. So you can't count him out. I think he's going to be back, and he's going to be strong. So for what it's worth, I actually learned a lot about eyeballs reading um, this article. And these articles are all on Common Tread. You can read more. But there's, it's like <laughs> there's muscles behind the eye. So this is a specific muscle that won't let him look like down and to the right, I think, or down and to the side. And it's only in one eye. So it's obviously a pretty big deal if you're racing motorcycles if you can't move your eye a certain does that, way. Does that mean when he's like going through corners, he's cross-eyed trying to look <laughs> You, you know, do that way them. too well. Because you do it often. For those, for those well, of you I, that, don't, that don't hang out with you enough, you do that a lot. I'm, you do it very well. <laughs> I'm no Mark Marquez, but I did race motorcycles for a while. So you learn to cross your eyes so that you can see more than one thing at once. Um, anyway, point being, I, you love a recovery story. You sort of hope that someone like that comes back because he's so, if you're into MoGP, you know he's just sort of has win it or bin it attitude. And, uh, and he's super, super exciting to watch. So hopefully the 2022 season is, is good. I'm already very excited. We, we had to, Jen and I had to not have this conversation beforehand. We wanted to talk about it. We're like, save it for the stage, and we got yelled at by the And I'm excited stuff. to get back to drinking in Austin. So, <laughs> I mean, for what it's worth. Nice, nice. All right, Spurge, what's next, man? So, we are going to move on to a little article about New York laws. So, I don't know if there's anybody here from the state of New York or around the state of New York. Um, oh, yeah. We have Ooh. one person. There's one person in the audience. <laughs> um, so, New York obviously has been cracking down on loud exhausts in New York City for a long time. Uh, however, uh, a new law was just passed by the governor, uh, which is called the SLEEP Act, and that stands for the Stop Loud Excessive Exhaust Pollution. Now, It's an acronym. I did not see that coming. It's like scuba. <laughs> What's scuba mean? <laughs> oh, I think I know this one. Self-contained Self underwater breathing apparatus. It's like... <laughs> thank you so much. No, thank you. You learn so much more than just <laughs> motorcycles here at High Side, Low Side. So here's the deal. This was actually an exhaust uh, law that was passed because there was apparently so much street racing going on in the state of New York that they needed to pass a law. So Bruce Springsteen would be proud because people are out <laughs> racing in the streets. Um, but the fine, the penalty is increased from $150 for a violation uh, for the previous law up to $1,000 per violation. And they're now not just cracking down on the individual motor motor motorcyclists, but they're also going after anyone that runs an inspection shop. If you pass an inspection for a motorcycle and they have a loud exhaust, you will be you can have your license revoked. What about all of the lives that are saved by the loud pipes is what I want to know. Which is the theme of <laughs> season four of High Side Losa. We've had a lot of loud pipes save lives conversations this year, so I figured this news piece was like right in line with that. It so I is, guess like how do you feel about the state of New York with this? It's super relevant and I'm curious. We, you you like a loud pipe? You're 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 a racer, you like a race pipe? Wait I mean it helps like with the whole sound of the engine too, I think. It's not just that it gets louder and I mean you know, I put a pipe on my SV650 SV back in the day, and uh -huh. I don't think it made it shatteringly loud, but it sounded better. I had better performance out of it. it and you lived in New York bike. at that time, right? I was in no. Connecticut, so. It's mini mm -hmm. New York. Tiny New York. <laughs> I thought, didn't you get the SV650 when you were in college? Yeah, but I didn't bring it to Brooklyn. Uh, the mean streets of Brooklyn. The mean streets of Brooklyn <laughs> will definitely snap that thing right up. So. Well, well, Jen makes a good point in the fact that this is not about like, oh, well, you put straight pipes on a Harley Davidson. This is any exhaust that you put on your motorcycle that makes it incrementally louder, you can be pulled over and fined for. Any exhaust? So, like, you know how you brag about, like, I have a twin Akrapovich on my KTM, and it constantly. just it doesn't make it crazy it loud. Constantly. It's just a little bit louder. <laughs> you, too, would be fined. Oh, that, that would be a real bummer, I have to say. <laughs> so, I guess, more to the point. What do you think about, like, is this a step in the right direction or is it a step in the wrong direction? Spurgeon Dunbar, go. I'm not going to get into politics because this is about motorcycles <laughs> and my feelings on government intervention. Um, but what I will say is that I have a lot of questions. Like, I live in Pennsylvania <laughs> and, if, and I like to ride in the Catskills. So if I am in the Catskills and I've got a Norman Hyde exhaust on my Bonneville or what have you, um, can I be fined? Like, can they come after me? Because then, uh, that, I mean, that's going to affect tourism. I'm sure moto tourism is at least, you know, three or 400 people a year uh, <laughs> in the state of New York. So I, I guess I have a lot of questions. But for me, I, I'm torn, right? Because we've talked a lot about loud pipes save lives. And I'm not, I'm not, 
I, I'm with you in the fact that I don't want a crazy loud exhaust, but I like something a little bit throatier. Sure, sure. Like you were saying, do you like like? A little I wish pop they would just do like a like a decibel reading or something. Right. Like if, if the cops so, are doing radar and, and decibel at the same time, like that seems that's fair. how it started, and now yeah. they're going one step further, which any exhaust that's even a little bit louder. So there's no there's no number associated here. I didn't do any research. He did all the research on this. This is how high side, low side works. <laughs> so it's usually masked by cameras and editors, but I do the homework, and then Zach shows up half drunk, and we just must our way through. <laughs> yeah, depends depends on the day. Um, but either way, it, I, so yeah, I, it, I'm torn in the fact that it is there is a lot of loose language in the way the law was written. There is no decibel. There is no right. because it's like. If, uh, if a certain motorcycle with its stock exhaust produces a lower decibel than another right. motorcycle with stock exhaust. I will go on measure? the record, since these two ninnies are too chicken, it's is a step in the right direction. It's a step in the right I know Boo. that there are a lot no. of questions. No, I disagree. <laughs> you disagree? 100%. I think it is. I think, I think we, we, should, we should all start to keep in mind that we should, we should be more respectful. If they're in the middle of Timbuktu and they're issuing tickets for pipes that are slightly louder, than, then I'll be disappointed. I'll, I'll admit that. But I think that like, there are too many GD loud motorcycles GD? in the world. Oh, yeah. that's, so we're doing this live. We have to edit the language um, because we can't. We can't. Persian's gonna yeah. swear, but I'm, no, I'm not. I'm not. Trying, you're not. Okay. I think you did a good job. Um, <laughs> I I can understand because we have this conversation a lot about if we want motorcycling to get better and to thrive, we have to get the public. Um, <laughs> you know what we're talking about the muggles. <laughs> But we have to get the public to, to, to buy in. Right. And so from that standpoint, I can understand how um, if people are out with loud exhausts, that could be a problem. Right. But yeah. I, I, don't, I don't want that away. What no. do you, like, no, you get the final say. I so agree. I disagree with Zach. Zach says that he feels one way. That's What's, right. You're the you're, you're the I, I want to meet somewhere in the middle. Again, no, like, come yeah, on. Totally what they want. <laughs> is not uh, on the agenda tonight. Well, I mean, I mean, for the New York state legislators, let's meet in the middle. Like, I see, I see. Oh, not, oh. not all aftermarket pipes are as outrageous as the Harley straight pipes are. True, um, true, And some true. of them will benefit motorcyclists and their bikes. So just make it about decibel reading because it's, it's all, again, at the end of the day, it's sleep. They don't want it to be excessively loud. Let's define that. And then I think there's still some room for some aftermarket pipes as long as they meet the decibel reading. How many You're, decibels are you going to allow? Okay, oh, all, right, all, right. all right, moving on. <laughs> we should move on. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, if loud pipes are so good, Spurgeon Dunbar, why are there special forces electric bikes that the army is testing. Well, I'm not taking my bike into military <laughs> situations, Zachary. I don't mind if they hear me coming. Fair enough. So this next story is about um, how special forces uh, in, was it in Dubai? Dubai. So, somewhere in the Dubai Air Force. Um, are testing Black Hawk helicopters with electric motorcycles strapped to the side so they can like land the helicopter, take the electric bike off and you know do recon, do army things. S specifically, they're strapping zero FX models to the side. So about right, 45 right. horsepower, top speed of 80 miles per hour. Pretty wicked. So I, I think that the reason that this, we think this is interesting and worth talking about is that uh, you know electric motorcycles are sort of, uh, you might say that's a whole other podcast, but they are polarizing in a lot of ways within the motorcycling community and it feels like we've all maybe been waiting for this quantum leap to happen. And I think military spending, like people caring about electric bikes that don't normally care about motorcycles, like we can't use internal combustion, so we're gonna use electric for the military, and now we're gonna dump a bunch of money in it. This is how technologies advance sometimes, when, when, when NASA or the military or something like that or starts- Or poachers in Africa buy <laughs> cake bikes from cake. Anybody listen to that episode of the podcast? <laughs> Hilarious. Or did you fall asleep by that? Jen, Jen, how many electric bikes do you own? I have two. How many times have you strapped into a helicopter? Not nearly enough times. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> that's, the, that's the end of the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. That, that ties it up. So what, one uh, bike that I tripped over years ago, I did a story about this bike um, that the, uh, Ameri the United States Department of Defense had contracted. It was a, I think it was a zero... DS or no, it was an Alta actually, which is those are the bikes you have. Yes, was, was that the DARPA project? Yes, the DARPA project mm -hmm. with the tiny little generator that ran on jet fuel that was mm -hmm. the size of a grapefruit and they could yeah. park it somewhere. Were you involved in this? I just have some awareness of it. That's it. That's and I can't say it anymore, or else the guys in the black suits will take me away. <laughs> Jen used to work at Alta, so that's why we're that's and, why we're questioning. And that. evidently the CIA, we didn't know that <laughs> until tonight. Um, but the point is, I feel like this is this is cool. And I don't know if, if you guys agree. Like, you know a lot about electric motorcycles from working in the electric bike industry. So I'm curious if you think that this kind of thing could really catapult electric bikes into into uh, a more public sphere. 
it has the potential to, for mm -hmm. sure. But um, like what what I know of the DARPA project and things like that is, it, it could be short lived. It's going to depend on who's signing the checks on that yeah. and how long they stay in that position or rank or whatever. So there's a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot of things I could just a floor will fall out from beneath you and the project's over. Right. So it's hard to say. True, true. I think there's like a, a ton of potential. You know, the, the army was using it, but the, but the the idea is sound for the public. You have your your electric street bike with a tiny generator that runs on some kind of fuel or another. You can ride it. So you've only got 80 miles of range with this bike, say. I'm throwing out numbers. You have a 50-mile commute. Well, you're kind of, you're pooched because you can't make it all the way to work and all the way home. But you ride there, park it, turn on the generator while you're working, it's chugging away, charges the battery, you come back out, you ride home. So you're burning gasoline to power your electric motorcycle. No, no, no. It runs on unicorn tears, actually, which oh, I think is... Oh, yeah, I yeah, didn't realize that technology's better. come around to the sophistication that we were expecting at this point. Jokes aside, they were they, one of the cool things about this DARPA bike, I don't, I don't know, hopefully I'm, I'm not misquoting this, but they, they had it run on all sorts of stuff. So like it could run on jet fuel or um, diesel or like... So a, we're like, burning yeah. jet fuel now to power. <laughs> you're, you're making, you're making your argument really... I mean, to be clear, I don't think it burned very much jet fuel, you know. It was ex extreme application, because they're going to be out in remote and they can't plug in anywhere else and that's why they're doing that but with the alta like you could plug into 110 outlet um there's even an app where you can find like free plugs to go plug into so like when i lived in escondido i just wrote to main street and you wouldn't believe this but the actual like street lamp posts have an outlet in them and i would go to the coffee shop and just plug in there so the taxpayers <laughs> of uh, escondido are that's paying right. for there's, you to charge legit, the there's an app that'll tell you where every like public <laughs> electric outlet okay. is and you could just like go around and poach electricity so it's like it's more accessible than a lot of people realize. But, so, but that makes sense to me. I don't see how this is going to further the cause of electric motorcycles. That's because right? you don't own a helicopter, <laughs> which we all agree is super lame. That's 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 <laughs> later on our list. Right, so right. we're getting okay. into, we're getting to that in a second. Fair enough. I'll raise my hand. It sounds like. Uh, Spurgeon and Jen agree. Stupid idea, Zach. Don't have... No, like, it's a cool yeah. idea, but you you're, th that's not what you said. You said, is this going <laughs> to further electric motorcycles okay. and people being interested and in And your them? answer is no. I think what would further electric motorcycles is swappable batteries, quick charging systems, like what we're seeing with Tesla. Like we rode out to, to Vegas. I was out in Vegas with, with Jen on a shoot last week, and right in... Uh, uh, it wasn't Barstow. What's the town with the big thermometer? Baker. Baker. They have a huge Tesla charging station yeah, now, yeah. right? Um, and I think that uh, if you could end up in a situation where if you're riding your zero in and you can pull the battery out, swap into a charging station, like what you do with a propane tank for your grill, pay 15 bucks, put a new one in, and just keep riding, that to me is the infrastructure that we need to get electric bikes. But like Zach said at the beginning of this, electric motorcycles is probably the whole of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, true enough, true enough. Does that seem feasible to you? The, what he just said, swappable batteries, all that? Is that the right way forward? That would be the ideal situation, oh, okay. but everyone's working very diligently on that. Nobody's <laughs> really done it quite right yet. So. Do you have an, just do an alternate situation that would work? I mean, I'd, I, everyone, not everyone, but like the fast charging situation is probably going to be the best. Like, um, right. I remember the Alta Mechanics when they did do quick battery swaps when we were doing Red Bull Straight Rhythm or other MX races. Um, the, the swap was intense and it took like three of our techs who practiced it and they, it would still like eight minutes was like incredible for them. And it's a mm. high voltage system. Like they all had to be certified to work on a high voltage. People don't realize like how difficult it is to make a swappable battery. It might work in our drill presses or, you know, whatever we're using around the house for home improvement, but to make it work at that high capacity is, is massively a big challenge and just a, it's funny because like I had rapid thought, charge I, would be better and that's why Tesla Tesla's very focused on that um well, no you mentioned drill press but I was thinking of like um and I don't know this doesn't really matter uh but I'm gonna say it anyway um I'm thinking of like the GoPro batteries that have the little tabs on them so I was thinking about like you took like you would like pop your thing up and you pull a little tab and you pull the battery out and you put a new one in but apparently that's not feasible this, this is good information I, didn't I, know I had no idea before you yeah. mentioned it I mean, we'll, Three we'll, we'll wait and see. It's, okay. it's two avenues, right. and we'll see who throws down all the money in the one, and that's probably what us, the public, will yeah, get. Yeah. So. All right. Well, speaking of the future, last thing we wanted to cover tonight was an article that our own Ari Henning wrote about on Common Tread, which is the hover bike that they tested also in Dubai? No. So this was... Ari, was it Japan? Yeah, Japan. 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 But it's what right you're, near but, Dubai for you geography but, nerds. Of course, it's on, Japan. The first article that we wrote, the very first time we wrote about hover bikes, I wrote an article about like two years ago now, and that was in Dubai. Like, uh, okay, Dubai gotcha, has gotcha, a gotcha. lot of crazy... That was where the police, the police force was... <laughs> 
Yeah, the no, police I knew I was going to be the one to do it. <laughs> the police force was testing hover bikes, right? Yes. Okay. It was, it was, there, was, there was a police force in Dubai that was testing hover bikes to catch criminals. Um, <laughs> Which is absurd. But that, that was two years ago, so we're already in the future. Um, but this is uh, for the consumer. This is a, a hover bike that for $680,000... Uzak can walk in no. and spend the family fortune, the court's that, family fortune, on that, a hover bike. That's that's Jen Dunstan money. I don't think I can afford that. <laughs> Way too much. That is pretty cool. There's, I think there's a is there a video in the contract article? Yeah, there's a video of it. Um, if you if you want to check it out, seven hundred thousand uh, dollar hover bike, pretty nifty. For those of and, you watching this at home, Ari Henning's sitting in the wings. We're looking at him like he's gonna <laughs> like he's gonna give us the answers because we've clearly done our homework on this one. <laughs> we often make eye contact with Ari when we need a little energy boost. <laughs> Um, so you uh, you live kind of out in the, out in the sticks a little bit, a little bit rural. You could say that. Okay. <laughs> Hover bike might make sense. Not a lot of air traffic. We take it to I the mean, store. What do you think? I would think you would want that more in like downtown LA. So you could just like whoop, just like okay. you know above elevate traffic? up and just yeah, just just okay. go above all the cars. Now they can't well, hit you because you're above them now. That's I true. Would, that's, that's like that's, that's like the fifth element it. kind of stuff right yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> Oh boy. That'd be the situation for that. All right. Well, I'm not sure that it's really going to catch on either, but it is a it's a fun uh, nod to the future of motorcycling. I think. I think it would be fun to ride. I think <laughs> that uh, there's probably a lot of other uh, questions that we need to ask ourselves as far as like how does this work and what's the legality. We, we we're having problems with like regulating drones, let alone you know hover bikes. A drone with a person on it does seem a little sketchy, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, I think there's any, any other any other final notes on the news here. Anybody? Spurge, Jen, Jen, any, any last final comments that you want to <laughs> oh leave us God, off? Oh my God! Don't with? put this on me. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> then, if, if if there's nothing else, that is going to wrap things up for the news. Jen, we are going to bid you adieu. Warm round of applause for Jen Dunstan, and then Mr. Ari Henning is going to join us as we dive into the main topic of today's podcast. And so, while you're clapping, warm round of applause for Ari Henning. Come everybody. on, keep it going. Right. Look at him. Look at him. <laughs> Hey, buddy. Hey, everybody. So, hover bikes. I, can we just back it up a moment and reference the fact that you're Spurgeon Jr. and your father's name is Spurgeon and your aunt's name is Spurgeon? <laughs> Did well, anybody we, see that coming? We brought that back around. That's the plot it's, twist. What's funny was everybody always, they, they hear the story and they're like, so did they have a daughter first? <laughs> and they really wanted a boy and they named her Spurgeon because they didn't think they were going to get a boy. No, my dad was born first. Um, and then they... Just kept it going. That's so, amazing. Yeah. Also, there is a Spurgeon Street. We are on the corner of Spurgeon. So, like, so there, there were some people that pointed that out, and uh, we, that was not planned. <laughs> I had no idea. It was definitely planned. <laughs> yeah, it's part of the plan. So, uh, you in, in the article you mentioned that you would love to have a hover bike because Ari and I are big Star Wars fans. They always wanted a speeder bike. Correct? Absolutely. I used to ride my dirt bike through the woods as a kid and pretend I was on Endor. I mean, who did? I mean, who did? Come yeah, on. But didn't yeah. you want to shoot the furry, cute creatures? Yeah, I did. I could. They were good <laughs> yeah. for target practice. Yeah. Uh, that's the fantasy world. <laughs> but, Eric pointed out, for those Star Wars fans, I don't want to get too far off track here, Star Wars is actually the past, not the future. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. We can probably move on to motorcycle <laughs> stuff. Um, the, the topic of tonight's discussion is eras in motorcycling, which we thought would be kind of a fun thing to talk about um, history, and uh, there's lots of different kind of um, nuances and reasons to love the different eras of motorcycling. Every, pe people often like old motorcycles, or some people are super into new tech, and we figured it was an excellent way for the three of us to have an argument, which of yeah. course is the whole point. I'm of glad you didn't use the word discussion. <laughs> right. Webster's Dictionary defines era as a oh system of chronological dates <laughs> for my particular noteworthy event. Right there, you see it. Yeah, you're going with geology, yeah. huh? No, yeah. I, no, the geology was up top. I also had an era of geology several hundred million years. That one doesn't work for this discussion. No, but the, uh, the system of chronological dating for a particular noteworthy event, and I think that's kind of more of what we're talking about here. Noteworthy events. So I'm going to put you on the spot, Spurgeon Dunbar. Oh, no, I guest honors, guest perhaps. Guest honors. Hot seat. How many eras... Break it out really succinctly for us. Would there be in motorcycle? Would you, would, would I you mean, say? Should we, like, that was a nice no, definition no, of no, eras. No, we have, to, we have to define an era. Yeah, yeah, I, I, say, I just gave Webster's definition. Yeah. We as, are not Webster's. As far as motorcycling is concerned, I think a good criteria and structure for that is technology. That seems to be the de facto, right? Like people talk about the two-stroke era. They talk about the pre-war era, the post-war era. So I think technology and also with racing is the same thing. Like it's very much driven by tech. So I feel like that's probably, I mean, it is what 
it seems to be the predominant determination for how we talk about motorcycles. Until you get to present day. So I would agree with you, because I was, I was trying to write this out, and I was thinking about a couple different ones of like, you have the pre-war, you have the, the era of the British invasion, you could say the Japanese invasion, um, two strokes, dirt bikes then split off in the 70s. But I do think that once you get to a certain time period that's a little bit closer, you get 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. I would still, I would it still put those. Simple. Yeah, it can't be that simple. I would still say like that's a two stroke, there's a two stroke era of like the 60s and 70s, and then there's the inline four era of the, I guess, 70s, 80s, and 90s. There's the modern fuel injected era, and I guess now you guys already talked about it, but there's the electric era. So you're going, you're going bigger chunks than not smaller chunks. I think you can slice it as thin as you want based on how interested you are and how much you know. Well, it was interesting because Zach and I were doing uh, Instagram Live the other night, and Patrick Garvin jumped on and was like, well, you got to split the 90s in half because there's, like, cool stuff that happened in the 90s, and then <laughs> there's, like, the chopper about. era. And, yeah. like, and Patrick Garvin is a avid cruiser rider, but he was just like, I don't need a helicopter-themed motorcycle. Mm -hmm. Or a Spider-Man bike. Not yeah. interested. They're not interested. Yeah, enough, so it's a little enough. bit of an elusive topic, but, I mean, I think we can, we can probably settle on, like you said, pre-war, post-war, two-stroke. Well, what's before pre-war, I think it's like strapping that's an engine like on a bicycle. Everything before the war. Every, World no, War II. I don't, I, don't think it, I, don't, I don't think that's fair. It was like bicycles. They had but the that's my tires point, is that I think that there's a developmental era where they were trying to figure this out, and then I think there was an actual era where we had what we know now as motorcycles, right, which well, would be us. the pre-era. Tell us about it. I'm curious. <laughs> I don't know that much about that period. That's of time. the problem. Yeah. We weren't around. It's a exactly. long time. You got to read a lot of Wikipedia articles. But I, I do think there's a split there of like the early development into what became, you know, so pre-war. Admittedly, the early development Davidson. is when they're taking an engine. It might have been steam. It might have been gas, and they're basically strapping it to a bicycle. Yes. Yeah. They don't really look like motorcycles. It was. Right. It was before they really settled on how they would power the bikes. Yeah. Which it was probably kind of an exciting time. Aside from other stuff that was going on in the world, we're not talking about that. Just from the sake of, from the standpoint of motorcycles, Great Depression, probably no, no, way before wars. that, way before that. I'm talking about you know, like late 1800s when they were like they were trying to figure out how to power motorcycles. And, and there was you, so much experimentation. Yeah, like they had they had V8 motorcycles in like the turn of the century and inline fours and like all sorts of crazy and opposed steam. fours and stuff. And they made like and five horsepower. Yeah, they it was were ridiculous. Like, <laughs> They'd be like 1800 cc's and make 12 horsepower. <laughs> and electric, a lot of electric vehicles back then. Believe it or not, like electric cars were actually kind of a big deal. So if they've got an 80 mile range now, then it was probably like an Eighth Boy, of a mile it was range. probably pretty rough. But, but I think, the, I, the, I think that, motorcycles aside, though, like there's also a definition error of like what was the development of roads? Like where were you riding yeah, these motorcycles? Point, yeah, and I think sure. that comes into play. Too. Every bike was an adventure bike back then. You might say that would be the, the era of Spurgeon Dunbar, right? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's on that's, that's actually that's what Harley Davidson tried to do when they came out with the Pan America. They really they hearkened back to like right. we built adventure bikes before anybody else. Before oh, they there did. were roads. They, did try yeah, exactly. yeah, they, really, they really tried to you like just, you just shove that down your, your throat with their little marketing campaign. You just like build motorcycles before there was pavement. That doesn't yeah. count. Anyway, the point is, I I would argue that that was one of the most exciting eras in motorcycling to begin with because one, you know, I don't know, like w the cookie might have crumbled a slightly different way and motorcycle technology would have taken a, a different turn. But instead, you know, companies like Triumph and, and Royal Enfield and Harley Davidson sorted out the internal combustion thing and, and that was what, what, what blossomed and turned into, the, turned into what motorcycles are today. But it's interesting to think about what could have happened then and completely derailed what we know the history of motorcycling to be today. If anyone yeah, has there's, there's, to say about that. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of experimentation and novelty. And I think looking back on it, it's entertaining. But yeah, you see a lot of directions that they tried where you're like, yeah, that, that makes sense that it didn't work. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's totally fair. I also think another thing to, uh, to talk about with eras is when there was a, um, when, when the cultural era aligned with the technological era. Like, you know, like you're, we're talking about pre war, post war. That was also a time when, when motorcycling pivoted. In, in a pretty large way, right? You know, GIs came back from, especially in this country, you know, people came back from the war and, and they bonded over riding motorcycles and being, you know, together in kind of a different way than, uh, than motorcyclists had before. It was, it was like an esoteric means of transportation and, or it was a war machine or something like that. But it turned into this thing that people did together. And because the technology shifted, that was around the time that Harley Davidson, you know, shifted from uh, you know, total loss oil systems, and you know they were still sorting out which side. Keeping the, the oil in the engine, right? Was the, a big, that was, was a technological a big, yeah. leap. Right. There was a time when when the oil went into the engine and, and then just, just went out, out the, the bottom, bottom of the engine as you rode along, which is which is kind of crazy. But anyway, I think that's like there there are some really 
distinct times when the, the culture of motorcycling shifted as the technology did, and that seemed like it was particularly seismic because those two things changed at the same time. But that didn't happen very often. So uh, oftentimes what we like to do on high side, low side is give book recommendations. And I think that we oftentimes uh, get a, 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 a rap of... Uh, very often. I've read a lot of books because of High Side, Low Side. I've got Zach. Zach is giving me book books recommendations. Mini bike yeah. books. No, I've had people like send in mini bike recommendation books for, for books. Anyway. Children's books. There's a book called Old Man. <laughs> right at my level. Uh, there's a book called Old Man and the Harley. And it is a phenomenal read. Uh, it takes place in 1939. It's actually uh, the son writing the story of his father. And what he talks about is in 1939, uh, his father gets this used Harley Davidson and he decides he's gonna just ride across the country. And his father eventually ends up, you know, having this amazing journey, will then go off to World War II, and then later in the book, he like recreates the journey with his dad years later. But my point is, is that it's an amazing read to get a look at this era of motorcycling. There are no roads. If you stop at a gas station, at one point he his gas tank starts leaking, and at every gas station there's a person that knows how to weld. So he comes in, they drain the gas, they weld his gas tank for him, and then he moves on. And like, all I could think of is like, could you imagine like needing a welder at the local you know Sunoco gas station when you're on a road trip? Like, you you'd have to find a specialty mechanic. So it's just this, it's a really unique look at this era of motorcycling. And I think for anybody that likes, you know, riding and adventure and like taking a road trip, it's a really you know. Speaking to two guys that just did Alaska on Trail 125s, <laughs> probably a, a very similar experience. I would like to point out that Spurgeon has never recommended that book to me. Has he recommended it? Yeah, to I don't you? know what he's talking about. I <laughs> didn't say this particular book. You recommended. Also, how did we become? How did we start reviewing books? Or thought we were talking about eras of motorcycles. That is an era of motorcycling. It's <laughs> a great. It's a great look at the pre-war era of motorcycling when it was rural and rugged and when there were no roads. Like you literally like roads were no paved roads, right? No paved roads. Yeah. No paved roads. <laughs> yeah. I think that the the um, another super interesting split was when dirt bikes became their own thing, right? Like Very the much so, yeah. racing off road for a while was a British single cylinder you motorcycle. Modified a street bike to ride <laughs> yeah, off road, and exactly. then finally they're like, "We should make motorcycles specifically for this." Right. You just compressed your spine with a massive. <laughs> yeah, and you're on a 450 motorcycle. pound motorcycle. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And then they figured out suspension and and jumps and that kind of thing. And and there was this there was this split that turned into a cultural split, and 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 motorcycling sort of broadened in a really really profound way because the, these the two branches of the tree kind of paired off, which again is another thing if you think about. Could have been different. Could have been different, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. It's like evolution, right? Like you don't know where it's going to end up. Yeah. So, sure, sure, sure. Pretty, so I'm pretty happy with where we have ended up. Just to be clear, what we're talking about here for people that aren't aware, we're talking about like in the f late 50s and 60s. If you wanted a dirt bike, if you wanted to ride off road, um, you were primarily taking uh, British motorcycles, and you Big, were heavy you twins. were modifying them extensively, uh, and you were you know going to ride off road with them, and then into the 70s then people started building more specific machines. So that's about the time period that we're referring to. Would you say that's accurate? With the dirt bikes branching so. off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the yeah, 70s in general were just like, right. th things were growing exponentially. Yeah. Technology was improving dramatically. And again, there's a lot of experimentation. So more to the point, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put something to you guys. Pre-World War II, one era. Post-World War II, <clears throat> another era. Post-1970, era three. So you're, lump, you're, so you're lumping f late 40s, 50s, and 60s all together? Correct. OK. Yeah, all that black and white stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's another era. And I think, like as you, you said, like moving forward, it, the, arguably, the evolution happened even faster. But I think, I think yeah, pre-war, post-war to 1970, 1970 to 1985, and then 85 to 2010, and then 2010 to present. Why 85? Sport bikes. Yeah. GSXR 750. Okay. Very, so very pivotal, yeah. in my opinion. But I would, I would cut that a little finer. I would say like yeah. late 60s to mid 70s, because 1970 is when the Clean Air Act happened. That's when the two strokes started going, pew. Yeah. But previous to that, I mean, the two strokes were, dare I say, on the pipe. There was, <laughs> there was lots of them, and they were pretty tremendous. And, and it was kind of a short lived through the 70s because of, right. the, of the Clean Air Act and all that. But another that, great book recommendation like is actually Stealing Speed. That's where they talk about that. Because uh, right. two strokes actually came from um, uh, missile technology from World War II. Right. They smuggled, after the Cold War, well, during the Cold War, they smuggled uh, V 2 rocket technology 
from Nazi missiles into Japan. And that's where a lot of this technology started from. Was well, the expansion chambers? Ernst, expand, expand, Ernst Stegner. Ernst Stegner. Yeah. Defected yeah. And from East Germany, West Germany? That's working for Eastern, MZ. MZ. Yeah. yeah. And then you yeah. went to Suzuki, was it? Yep. Yep. We should have done more research. Anyway. I mean, it's distant so, history. So let's talk a little more about the modern stuff. Like, I, I think... You, 80, said, you said 2010, right? I said 85 to 2010. Is, yeah. Is that then, trash control? Yeah. Like the electronics Electronics, yeah. yeah, exactly. That's where, in my mind, you know... It wouldn't have been that... Two th I mean, 2000... Per performance? Five. When it became prevalent. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I mean, BMW had ABS on motorcycles in the early 90s. Late 80s, maybe? Late 80s. Yeah, yeah. So, but it I think sucked. that was... <laughs> yeah. And it was the size of a car battery. Yeah. Anyway, um, I think that's, that was super pivotal because that's where you you saw uh, all of these mechanical advancements. Motorcycles had to have a mechanical advancement in order to be better. And then since 2010, in my opinion, in large part, the mechanics have been largely the same. And the way that they have improved is mapping the engine, is, is changing ABS Which mapping. Which isn't as exciting. Like hardware yeah. improvements in hardware technology, that's exciting because you can see it and it's tangible. When they improve software so the TC works a little better, it's like, right. yeah, that's nice and everything, but right, right. not quite as exciting. But couldn't you argue that then like the evolution of points and condensers to you know, an electronic ignition would have been a major advancement? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, but I think that's I think that's mechanical, really. That's a pretty substantial. I know, but that's what I'm saying. It's is not that, is, are you, But are you taking? I, I'm agreeing, but like, aren't you? Where does that fall into your breakdown? I don't remember. Can anyone remember what I said about the errors? No. Okay, I don't know. Yeah. Somewhere <laughs> it, it falls between the 70 and the 85. That was era three. Four. Thank yeah. you. All right. Somewhere whatever. You know. We have got a math quiz in the audience, errors. ladies and gentlemen. I yes. Think, yeah. I, to me, that's a mechanical. That's an example of of. Of mechanical advancement, you know that's 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 like uh, th you know that's going from two valve to four valve. It, it's the same thing as an internal engine part becoming more advanced based on uh, physical limitations, not software being advanced. So, so I guess my question is, are we breaking? So it sounds like you're trying to break the errors down. We, we're still only on the I'm second. I'm trying, trying to. You guys are giving me no, but, but are you doing it more mechanically though? Is that like, is it, like in your head? Is that what you're trying to do here? Is it more mechanical evolutions? Well, like I said in the beginning, Spurgeon. I think that the most, the, the easiest ones to delineate are ones where there were culture shifts as well, which is why I think World War II is, is important because it was so different after that and why I think 1970 was important because the, the branch of, of, of dirt bikes and the prevalence of two strokes and that kind of thing, I think that, uh, I think that that's, that's my definition as, as, I'm, as I'm moving forward. Does that make sense? Yes. So it was a combination of the mechanical and then also the major cultural shifts. It could it's not like be more subjective. Correct. <laughs> Yeah, and those yeah. all overlap, and it's, you know, <laughs> we're talking about mechanical, you can also say that's the same as technology, and then the culture shift comes from the technology, so I think it's, you can lump it all together. Sure, sure, sure. But we uh, still got to figure out what the errors are. Exactly. Okay, so you guys not agree? I'll agree with you. No, I agree roughly. Uh, honestly, uh, I, yeah, my, I will agree I with you. I inserted my, my little um, footnote in the late 60s and 70s. You did, you did, And you I'm did. good with that. Okay, all right, all right, fair enough, fair enough. Mark the date, everybody. November 19th, 2020, 2021. Uh, we Spurgeon, have the errors. Spurgeon and area agree with Zach. Um, so the next question is, what... <clears throat> what was the golden era of motorcycling? Using that basic framework, you can have your own opinions as well. I think only one person's been paying attention to what the eras actually were. But uh, what, what do you guys, again, guest honors, do you have like a, do you have a gut reactionary, like the, the golden era, you know, like the, the true peak of? Uh, yeah, and it's, I guess I've got, some, I've got some weird reasons for it. I think the 70s, probably, and a lot of that has to do with the stories I've heard from my father about racing in the 70s, like during the Grand National Championship, when if you wanted to win, you had to do a mile dirt track, a half mile, a short oh, track, a TT, a road true. race on different bikes oh. and be the same rider. So like that's the era of like Gary Nixon and Gene Romero and yeah. Kenny Roberts, like sure. pretty badass mofos right, in the right. sport. Like the, the, the on any Sunday yeah. crew of people, the, those yeah. of you seen on any Sunday, hopefully everyone here has seen on any Sunday. And if you it's haven't, iconic. do it. Um, so that's the racing side of things, which yeah. I think is just makes it the golden era as a spectator. But there's also the, the technology. So like within that era, you're going from a uh, single overhead cam to double overhead cam. You're seeing like a prevalence of, of inline fours. So like horsepower and revs are coming up. Um, you're seeing the two strokes that I talked about before. Um, so like, you know, RDs and RZs and TZs, like pretty iconic bikes, RG500, stuff like that that comes along. So I don't know. There's there's definitely a, a romance that goes with that two-stroke era and with the the 
the big leaps and bounds we saw and how good bikes got, like disc brakes and all that sort of stuff. So that's, yeah, I think I'd settle on the seventies. Okay. That's hard to argue with, Spurgeon. No, Will you, you argue with him. No, I'm I'm gonna let Very you curious. go. Yeah, I took, just good, going with I took that. the good one. No, I'm not agreeing with him. You're not. No, no. I'm, I'm, I, I, want, I, want, I, want, I want you to. You go want to go back to that dirt road era? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure yet. So like honestly, I have ADVs a hard time. for everybody. Spurgeon Dunbar. I have a hard time. I have a hard time with the question because like I think that there's there's definitely something romantic when you think about the pre-war era. There's definitely something romantic. When yeah, but when did KTM get founded? 1951. So it's going to be somewhere you around looked there. It up. It's you certainly not going to be everybody. before then. Yeah, you act like I wasn't going to know the answer to that one. <laughs> um, I, it's, it's, it's hard because like, I think that there's romance in all the eras. And I think when I was thinking about this question, um, I'm going to split my answer. Because I think that there was, you could say that the romantic you know, pre-war era of like it was a free crazy wild place to do this would have been really cool. I think some of that carries over into the 60s, and I think I like the idea of 60s and early 70s motorcycles more. Like if I had to if I had to like, you know, spend some time having an adventure on like a TR6, I would probably be completely okay. More so than like a 19, you know, 39 adventure Harley Davidson. So I, I think that for me, I would go with the the late 60s era because you still get some of that, you know, wild and free. But the bikes were a little bit more advanced, and you could, you know, you could have a, a little more of a functional machine. I would say you could have a, a 38 horsepower 500. That's much more appealing to me than a 12 <laughs> horsepower, you know. <laughs> cruiser. Yeah, I don't think any of us want to go back to the pre-war era. That's yeah. like that'd be fun to look at and yeah. maybe ride around the block, but like, no, thank you. That's so I, I like I like the fact that you you have some of that you know mentality that's still around, um, you know, and, and even like the desert racing scene that was going on in Southern California in the 60s. Like, there's just um, the, the international six heyday. days trials. Like, so like, much was happening. There was and so much racing and, like, and riding me, like, everywhere. We we talked about this in the one podcast, and that's where like the comment about the mini bike book came up. Like you you're reading. Your, this your book children's from the 70s, book that my, my child's book yeah. that I yeah I, I still read to it's this got day. Got the big pictures and <laughs> yeah. short sentences. I like I like the pictures, but they, and even when you're talking about like on any Sunday, like there's there's so much of that era um, that I think it would be fun to go back and explore. You know. Yeah, that's that's totally fair. So what, right, are, what, what about you, on? Zach? No, oh, come no, on, Zach. Come on. <laughs> that's so hard to argue with. You but, like those 16 and a half inch wheels? Just no, I don't. I don't. That's the that next like question. Don't get ahead of yourself. Mid nineties or something? No, when, when were they no, doing that? I don't know. I don't know. You know what? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little bit of a weird right now, right now. What this a time to be alive in the world of motorcycling to have. So Aren't many... you all so lucky yeah, in the audience huh? right now? You are We're living in the best era. You gotta of live in the moment. Yeah, yeah. You, you sort of do. I mean, I just I feel like that we we often you know a lot of what we do. Some people have had some questions about what we do. Actually, I, I met a few of you outside and. On more you than get one paid occasion, for this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, on more than one occasion, I got a question was, what exactly is it that you do here? You know, like I know you do the podcast and like you know you make videos and like did you do anything else? Um, which is fair. <laughs> My family asked me the same question, but we do I sit that, at desks a lot. Yeah, we do sit at desks a lot. Um, but you know, one of the things we do is review motorcycles and talk about how um, you know, how they've changed and how they've evolved, and we think a lot and talk a lot about this. And I guess what we often come back to is just the, the span of motorcycles that are available now and the, the, the levels of capability, it's, it's remarkable. Like tires are better than they've ever been, whether you're, you're riding off road or you're riding on road and the, the performance, you know, the sort of thrill of riding a fast motorcycle on a racetrack, if that's your thing is more advanced and more impressive and faster than it's ever been. And I guess I feel like, how could you not be kind of blown away by the capability and the, and the time that we live in? There's like there, there's a, there's a wider variety of bikes maybe than there's ever been. Yeah, I, w I would agree with you. I guess my question is, don't you wonder at all about? I, I, I think part of the appeal of this question to me was like something I haven't experienced. Like obviously I'm I'm, I'm riding motorcycles so, today. So you're intrigued by it from a time travel perspective. Yes. Not so much as it. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. I think I would uh, I'd support what you're saying because we we think about these earlier eras and obviously we're viewing them through rose-colored glasses. Like, let's not forget how <laughs> tires were and how unreliable <laughs> motorcycles were and like heavy and not necessarily good. Like, I think we do we have it excellent right now. The, right. the vast majority, the 
we do review a lot of motorcycles, and it's very rare that we come across one where we're like, this isn't good. Right. That's, right. Argue, that's arguably really the hardest really part of the job sometimes. Yeah. Right? Because people, we'll, we'll see all of your comments that you leave for <laughs> us, and people are like, oh, you're, you're so nice about that motorcycle. I'm like, right. I don't know. It wasn't that bad. Like, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I could take a Kawasaki Z700 and pretty much have a great time with it, and it's a $4,000 motorcycle. Is a Z700 no, a motorcycle? No, sorry. Z400. Z400. I, I yeah. rode a 1969 Kawasaki H1. That's why we have editors, people. Yeah. Well, we don't have them this time. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I rode an old bike recently, an iconic old bike, and like it had yeah. soul and it sounded rad and it was cool, but holy crap, did it suck. <laughs> like if you wanted to open the throttle and go fast and sound absolutely wicked, it was terrific, but if you right. needed to turn or slow down, and God forbid you're turning and you hit a bump, and this is like a restored, rebuilt 1969 <laughs> bike, like as new as with, it could be for being that with old. With modern tires. With modern tires, yeah, right, right, it was right. still like, oh, oh yeah. no I, thanks. I rode it for a day, and I was like, that's enough. Well, that was like in the video when you're on the Trail 90, and you're like going through the corner, and you're like, nope, nope, I'm yeah. not, I'm, I'm bailing uh, on this one. Uh, yeah. Again, those are modern tires. Yeah. 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 I know my, my dad's here in the audience, I think if he hasn't left already. Um, he's here, uh, believe it or not, and one thing he, he talks about, we, we've talked about this uh, ad nauseum as well and uh and he he started road racing in the early 80s and um and he said yeah i would just be going through a corner and then i would just crash for no reason i would just i don't had no idea what happened and he would when i started racing in the late 90s and early 2000s he would you know he would say like i can't believe what i can get away with now you know like i'm riding i'm a better rider now sure but like tires slide they like tell you when you're about to crash they're, they're, it's, a, it's a massive massive quantum leap so i totally agree with you about the rose color glasses so we've got it good now yeah, yeah. i think this so. is the good era maybe yeah. i yeah i, I, I agree again. <laughs> I, 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 you, I, I, just say, I just want to do the time travel thing like so, I, I'm, I'm still enamored by something that i didn't get to experience because there's there's so many of these great stories whether it's you know your dad telling you your stories your dad my dad telling these stories <laughs> even um, if they're horror stories in other words they're stories they're stories but they're but they're <laughs> but they sound like it's kind of like it's just something different that we'll never get to experience and i think that's part of the charm as we think about this question. So I don't know Let's, if we have to have a right answer, but no, no, maybe but, not, I, but, maybe. but I would say that we do have it good. I think so. I think so too. So th I want to touch on this one quickly, um, which we kind of just did. So you, you guys, is, is the main reason that you would do that because you want to ride in that era? Is it like you want to experience yes. that? Okay. All right. Because it's, it's the bikes and, and it's the bikes. Yeah. The bikes and the scene, the culture, okay. like all the different racing. Right. It's less about the bikes and more about the culture and the scene for me, I, I would okay. say. Like, right. I, I think the but bikes play the guitar. So. I think he's into the scene. You know what I mean? So I think, I think uh, we, we um, the, I, so I answered it as sort of like what I think the golden era is as a blanket statement. But I have to admit, if I was going to ride and if I was going to try one thing, I, it would have to be like, you guys have heard me say this a zillion times, but like a 500 GP. I know. I, from, I was waiting for that. I'm surprised yeah. you didn't say the 500 GP era. I mean, well, well, that's because I, I sort of knew I could sneak it in here. Yeah. But I do think that, 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 that we live in the golden era right now as far as what's available. But I, I think that what about if I was, as far as it sounds like you're changing goes. your answer. Oh, that's a different question. You have the same document I do. You, you wrote you, it down you, beforehand. You've switched to a new question now? Yeah. Oh. I'm allowed to do that. I'm a co-host. I, no, I, I, okay. I was, just wasn't right, paying attention. Right. Well, anyway, I'm waiting for the audience member over here to tell us which question we're on. And this, I haven't yeah, you're hired by the way. Our, yeah, yeah. our new producer over here. Yeah. Thank you so much for all your help. Um, all right, so let's let's move to. Well, I have one more question. What is the worst era? If if you had to avoid, like last that's, on that's your list. That's not on the list. No, I know. That's. A, I'm also allowed to do that. Pull surprise, that out surprise. of the hat. <laughs> hmm. Worst you, era. I think so. I'll go first this time, since evidently I sprung this on you guys. We talked about this in one of the meetings, I think, and uh, and I've been noodling on it. And I feel like if I feel like I was born in 1983, so it's a little bit of a weird answer. But early 80s for me, to heck with that. Yeah. Before turbos, yeah. but a, and after fuel crisis. And, and before just, aluminum twin spar frames. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, big and heavy, and not necessarily very exciting. Yeah, yeah. It, it just it was it was kind of a feeble time. I think you, you, you also the, the the early days of kind of those weird cruisers, the Japanese cruisers that came right. in. Some of which were pretty good motorcycles, but overall it was like an influence that I was like, ah, you guys right. just keep making sport bikes. Right, right, kind of austere. And well, it was funny because I hadn't even thought about the fact when we had this conversation the other day, and Patrick Garvin was like, well, don't don't forget about the the late '90s with all of those crazy chopper sixty thousand chopper six thousand yeah. dollar choppers. But there were also a lot of really great bikes that I enjoyed out of the the mid to late '90s. Um, Name ten. Honda Super. It's going to be a bar in there. I know it. Yeah. 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 Oh, we're, 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 late 90s. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, copy, copy, copy. Okay. I'm, what I'm did you think I said? I thought I, I barely listened to what you said. I thought you were saying <laughs> I thought you were saying early 80s and I was like, no, no wait, man. No, 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 no late no. 90s. Late ni- I have yeah. to agree with you. But, but but so but I started thinking about that. I was like, well, I can't I can't discount that entire era just because of, you know, the chopper craze because there were a lot of other yeah, there's other stuff going bikes. on at the same time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The more that I thought about this, the era that I would say was the worst was the early days, right? Like How the, early? like 1800s to 1920. Like okay. that developmental era, like, and I, but I say that because there's a lot of terrible machines. But there's a lot of people out there from the historic collectible side of things that like that whole that whole era. So I think for me, it's like when you really think about what it would have been like to ride a motorcycle in like 1920, that it it, it wouldn't have been fun. Like it <laughs> wouldn't have been fun. I love that. Been You're here first. Miserable and slow. Yeah. Although remember, uh, we did a story about a guy named Glenn Curtis. Years ago at Motorcyclist, and um, he was the one who had that V8. Was it V8 or V12? I think it was a V8. It was a V8, and it was that, huge. That he had in a motorcycle, and he was it's like, "I'm speed, gonna, right? Yeah, and he was like, "I'm gonna go as fast as I can." And remember, there was a we found something, uh, an anecdote from that era, from when he was About doing that, going faster than 100 miles an hour. Yeah, and they were like, "He's gonna need oxygen." Like, we don't know what happens his to the human body. His face is gonna get torn off. <laughs> yeah, like he might just disintegrate. It might I mean, just they wouldn't tear his face off. And now that's like, just yeah. Zach commuting to work on the freeway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right, but I mean, there there was a there was perceptions that were very bizarre. Yeah, certainly. But like, what a what a what a phenomenal time to be like going fast on a motorcycle where people like it was like going to the moon. Yeah. They didn't have any idea what was going to happen if they you didn't went know more than the other side of that. Yeah, like you could just disappear into a fifth dimension. But I think there's still some of that um, naivete into the. 40s and 50s, but in the 40s and 50s, you had better roads, better bikes. True. So I think you could have still had some of that excitement, um, but with better machines Plus, and more all infrastructure. The big nasty wars were behind us. So yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Then we're okay. just—it's a golden era. <laughs> the golden era. Okay. Okay. So, um, I guess the the I next, have a question. Next, you have a question. Yeah. I have Is a the question. next one on the list? So, no, not really. But we're we're going <laughs> off the list at this point. So I, I do want to say, you know, as we get into um, you know other questions that are here, what era of bikes have you ridden? Like, so if we had to look at like the bikes that you've ridden from different eras, right. what eras of bikes have you ridden slash owned? We've been Zach and I have been fortunate because our dads both raced and they raced in vintage classes where we got exposure to some really old stuff. Like, there's a class, there's classy hand shift right. where guys are literally riding bikes from the 30s and 40s that are hand shift, and they've got like a riveted together leather belt that is driving it. Yeah. There's only three guys in the grid, but they're yeah. out there doing it. I, I so I haven't ridden those, but I've seen them, and I was like, no, yeah. I don't want to ride that. I remember I remember uh, I did a race in Canada years ago, a track called Mossport, and um, I was on the grid. I was racing a uh, 1967 Ducati single, um, so drum brake, you know, uh, pretty primitive by today's standards, but right in the heart of, uh, of what vintage racing is all about, really, like late 60s, early 70s. And I was on the pre-grid waiting to go out for practice, I think. Um, you know, practice groups at a race event are like um, yeah, similar to a track day. It's yeah. just like, you know, all it's sorts a, of weird bikes. Yeah, all sorts of stuff. And there was a guy next to me on a Rudge. And is that, anybody familiar with the with the brand Rudge? I've heard the name, and, but I do not remember what it Rudge is. I haven't even heard the name. Anyway, it had um, an exposed valve train <laughs> with, the, with the hairpin. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I was sitting on the grid, you know, uh, waiting to go out on the track. And I look over, and the guy's sitting there, you know, and there's like drops of oil getting chucked off the drivetrain, like the tops of the valves. You can see the tops of the valves, and they're like, there's oil jumping off. That's what you the want for racing, racing, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm going to the track with this guy. Yeah, we don't want to go back to that. Area. Oh my but goodness. To answer your question, it's I think the earliest bike is probably the one that we have in the lobby at at Revzilla West. My dad's CB350, so that's like a 68. I, yeah, late 60s? Yeah, yeah late yeah. 60s. But that's, uh, I, that's yeah, been a question, lot of time the, riding that one. The question wasn't the oldest. It was how many different eras of motorcycles have you oh, ridden? Oh, excuse me. So we're, like, we're so using the, the uh, Zach like, Quartz. Like, yeah, we're working with four or five. <laughs> I guess it's three then. Okay. Yeah, 60s, 70s, whatever, 60s, 60s onward. 60s onward. Is that no, three? Is that three eras? You think so? Okay, cool. Fair enough. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I guess the question definitely becomes sort of like old. What's the oldest bike you were ridden? 70s. So I, said, I had a. I just sold a seventy six CB five fifty. Didn't you say that you spoke to Lance Oliver the other day and he'd never ridden a bike with a drum brake? Lance, the Silver Fox Oliver, everybody. He's like twice as old the, as any of us. Yeah, he's been alive since like the seventeen hundreds. <laughs> yeah. He said he's never 
ridden a bike with a well, drum brake. Well, that's because his first, his first bike was a CB350 twin. C- a CB360T. With a single yeah, but, but, single but that piston. Was a, yeah, but it had yeah, a, it was, you know, Honda right. was ahead of their game. You know? <laughs> so I, I just thought it was remarkable. Front. Yeah, very. Because if, if you folks have not ridden with drum brakes before, it's a wish and a prayer. It's terrible. terrible. It's, it's just, you just there is close no your feel. eyes home. Yeah, exactly. You're not like, oh, I'm going to pull it hard. You're like, pull it as hard as you can. If you didn't time correctly how long right. you need to slow down, then right. you're going to blow the turn. Yeah, Ari and I have raced a uh, number of vintage bikes, and you often sort of like, you, you go down the straightaway, and you get to the corner, and you just go, yeah, it's absolutely as hard as you can. And then they fade oh, lap after brutal, lap, brutal. and they get It's kind of like, you know, pre-ABS. So, there was no way you were going to lock it up. You just <laughs> yeah, clamp it down. Um, so I will say, I, I think... My, my dad had a bike when I was a kid that was a late 50s, 1956, 1959, maybe? I don't know. I'll have to ask him later. Um, was it BMW? out there? Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. Hmm. Um, oh, there he is. <laughs> um, it, was a, it was a BMW single cylinder, R27. So our, uh, a single, single cylinder, cylinder. Single cylinder, upright. Um, that doesn't little, sound right. Little BMW. BMW. I know, I know. Um, but yeah, 50s. But I've never, I've never ridden a bike from... Did you ride that one? Yes, I did, yeah. So that would be four eras for you then, right? Well, what did I say? No, no I said post-war. So we're all in the same boat, okay. because post-war to 1970 is what I said, and it sounds like we've all... Oh, no, you said 70s. I was 76. I'm 76, <laughs> this yeah. has only written in eras after 76, the 70s, am I right? Oh, my God. <laughs> all right, yeah, well, I, I, would, I would really like to try, um, and our colleague Aaron Frank at Motorcyclist uh, years ago got to ride, I think when the new Indian Chief came out, he got to ride an he original... Ride, and he rode, didn't he ride all the eras, or was it just maybe. a handful? But I know he, he rode the one from the late 30s, I think, or maybe whenever the Chief first came out, which might have been post-war. It might have been like 46 or something In like that. In any case, a very old motorcycle. Very old bike. And I always thought it was really cool to ride a bike from, from the 20s or something like that. I don't know. I, that, but just to be able to t- have a bike that, was, that had that many different delineations of it, I would say arguably the Indian Chief probably got a little bit fuzzy for about 40 years there. <laughs> probably probably didn't really count. Well, yeah, after um, yeah. 1951 or 53 or whatever it was when they folded and nothing really happened there. But yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think that would be a, it would give us a lot of perspective. And I'm a little bit ashamed, can I say, that I, that I have only ridden motorcycles as old as the 50s or something. Well, what you could say old. is if you, if you wanted to, to redefine the eras and we wanted to like split it up a little bit no, finer, too late for that. more no. eras. No, okay. No, no, way too late for that. All right. So, where, where are we at? Next question on the list here. Um, it circles back to my, uh, my pick for the golden era, which is right now, as we all know, um, the only right answer. Uh, and the question is, what are we missing in the current era? What, what, what about hover bikes? Previous? <laughs> They exist, though. Yeah. Not really. It's like a drone you ride. <laughs> yeah. It's fairly disappointing. Right, right, right. That's right. That's right. Um, but I guess if you could maybe put a finer point on it, since we didn't do a good job of putting this document <laughs> together, um, what would you take from a previous era and, and, and you know, insert into this one? Like, what, what are we missing? What, what do we need from what motorcycling has had that we do not have today? Louder pipes. <laughs> no. Nice. I no. feel like that deserves a round of yeah. applause. No, anyway. Louder, Louder pipes. pipes. They All will right. save your Let's life. For loud pipes, everybody. Um, All right. Is there anything that you want to do? Like, is there, is, like, is that really, like, I don't know. Like, what, you, you, like, why what don't about, you go, because you, I feel like you would probably, if, if anybody on the couch wanted to pick something, like, you would probably Call like couch. something a little bit more... <laughs> I Cheers, do like the furniture though. You guys did a good job. The, like, like, is there something from the vintage era that you miss having from a simplicity of oh, working on it? Standpoint? Yeah, not, certainly, not even, right? Yeah, certainly the simplicity, like being able to work on any of them because they are simple and they're easy to understand and they're actually wires going places and simple <laughs> electronics instead of ECUs. But I would say that um, it's not necessarily a technology or a hardware. It's a, it's a mentality of, of not being risk averse. I think now marketing has so clearly defined what manufacturers need to do in order to be successful and laws have so clearly defined it that I'm, I miss isn't the correct word because I wasn't there, but I long for the willingness to take risks that people did in that post-war era where they were just like, it would be a small startup. They'd be like, well, we used to make rifles and so we know how to bore things. So now we're going to make cylinders and we're going to make motorcycles. Like Do you just, BSA? Yeah, and just okay. building really cool, crazy stuff. And sometimes it didn't work, whereas now it's like they have to have a meeting and they have to make sure that it's going to meet the marketing <laughs> department's needs and it's going to make enough profit. Whereas before they were just like building crazy shit for the sake of doing it. Right, right. Do you, do you think that frontier exists anywhere in motorcycling now with, uh, I don't know, Electric bikes. Yeah, or the like, startups with the electrics. I right, think you right. know you get like a couple of folks in a warehouse with some understanding of how that stuff goes together, and they build a bike like that caulk you rode. Or that's what how Zero started in Santa Cruz, like just a couple yeah, of guys. Yeah, sure, sure. Who or, put a bike together? Or you rode that lightning. 
which is basically like a dude and some people. In some a, guy's warehouse in San Francisco that built yeah. a motorcycle that goes 200 miles an hour. Yeah, which yeah. is phenomenal. So, I, so it exists to a certain extent, I suppose. But I, I do appreciate what you're saying, which is that there are people just going for it. Yep. So, so would you like? Does that mean to, to transfer that to the to the era that we live in now or are riding in now? Would you be excited to see, you know, Toyota or or Facebook come out with a motorcycle just because you feel like it would be them spending money in sort of a frivolous way and have a different take on it? Or do you think it's over? Yeah, I feel like it's over. I feel like it's if over. you could inject some of that uh, willingness to experiment into the modern era, that would be cool, but I don't think that's possible. Because too many com- Because companies are too big, yeah. And there's the, the, you have to build a, an engine and a chassis and all that stuff that's so complicated. It was easier before because true. they were simpler machines. Yeah, very, very true. Very true. Every Henning hates meetings, by the way. Which, you know, we, you can all represent with, I think, if you, have a, if you have an office job. But he did point out we sit at uh, desks a lot and we go to a lot of meetings. So I'm not surprised to hear you say. Yeah, just get down to the machine. The freaking something. meetings, man. Am I right? I think one of the things that could make a comeback, and this kind of takes us into something that we've seen um, with the supply chain issues of the past, I don't know, year and a half. Um, so my great-grandfather owned a Pontiac dealership back in like, the, the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And the dealership model used to be you walked in and there were two models on the showroom floor. You took one for a ride and you came back and you're like, that's it, I'll take that one, the sedan. And then you went to a big book and you like picked out the, you know, the parts that you wanted, you picked out the accessories you wanted, you placed an order and three weeks later your Pontiac showed up. Um, I think as we think about the dealership model and what's it, what it looks like moving forward in an internet age, I think you could literally have the dealership be They've got one of every model on the floor. You show up at the dealership. You ride the bike that you know you want to take for a ride. You come back. You're like, I love it. And then you go to a computer screen, not a big book anymore. And you type in your computer screen, and you're like, I want the yellow one. I want the 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 foot pegs like this, and I want this. And then six days later, it shows up from a big warehouse in Nevada somewhere. And 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 you sounds like he's got it all figured out. Yeah, he's got, <laughs> But I, I think like when you think about it from, from the standpoint of how dealerships currently work, um, it works in a way that's a bit out of touch with the current reality of the way we're living the rest of our lives. So what can we learn from Pontiac, the Spurgeon Dunbar story? <laughs> I'm just saying, I think that there's, a, you know, you asked a question that I didn't really have an answer to, and I pulled <laughs> yeah, that one gave, out of my ass, so I'm giving myself a totally different, different question. question. Yeah. Well, it's, it's we, good information, it's a good perspective. To, to jump back to the news really quickly, sorry, Jen. Um, the, the, uh, we, had, we ran a story on Common Thread, our friend Andy Greaser, a story about how Zero has this thing where they unlock, you can purchase a motorcycle, and then in, with software they can unlock certain capabilities or keep them if you don't want to pay for it, which pisses people off, sure. But it's, is, it, is that not kind of like what you're talking about? So I'm going to mention KTM, and then I'm going to take a drink. All right, everybody, everybody take a drink if you can. There you go. So here's one of the things that I do not like, and this kind of, takes, <laughs> this, this kind of carries into what you're talking about. So on the new 790s, 890s, they already have a quick shifter on it, but you have to pay to have the quick shifter unlocked. Uh, like the sensor, the piece of hardware is already on the shift linkage. Yeah, it's it's there, and all you have to do is if you want a quick shifter on your, if you want it on your bike, you have that to pay would to piss have it unlocked. Me off. <laughs> and, and but you're starting to see that with you know the, the article that we were talking about with the evolution of the new yeah, electric bike. Multistrada had that with the adaptive cruise, right? Uh, with the radar, yeah. yeah. So like the hardware is on there, but it's not in the there. software. Yeah, yeah. All of it's there, like that. but you have to pay to have right. them right, right. unlock it. Right, right. That might have been a regulatory thing. But, 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 but in any case, it's becoming point, more prevalent yeah. because that's common in automotive totally, as well. Totally. Like you can yes. get a remote starter, the equipment's there, but you have to pay to use it. Right, right, yeah. So well, the argument is, is it, the, the manufacturers are trying to find ways to, to drive revenue up, but you know, they're also trying to be smart about the profit. So they just include it in everything, and then you're just paying to unlock certain features. Right. It's kind of like you know, video games or something along those lines. I don't play video games. I don't, know why. <laughs> I don't even know why I said that. <laughs> no, you're, we're not going to do that road. Yeah. So, um, to bring it back to the, what are we missing in the modern era? Um, would you, Ari Henning, if you were if you were god of motorcycling, would you would you snap your fingers and get rid of all the software and mumbo jumbo that you know? Would you go back to to um, to, to carburetors and not drum brakes, but you know, would you would Certainly you get rid of drum would you get rid of software? You know, like would would you no, just to make I, it easier to work on, make it more accessible for that people? That would be so short sighted. I mean, we have the benefits of ABS, and and not to mention, like we talk about how great those bikes in the 60s and 70s and 80s are, but boy, were they dirty as well. So, <laughs> yeah, you, know, okay. you know, I don't want to go back to carburetors that are leaky and get clogged up and sure. don't work well at elevation. Okay. Like, fuel injection is great, ABS is great, disc okay. brakes is great, all that stuff. But, you know, so I'm, I'm grateful for what we have, okay. but do miss that 
but maybe just so that it, maybe what we're missing is just some of, uh, and, I, and I think I feel like you're talking about it more from a mechanical standpoint. I miss it from, um, yeah, and I I, I don't want to say adventurous because then Zach's going to make fun of me. <laughs> um, but I miss it from like a, a, a sense of adventure um, <laughs> in, in the fact that like. No, but like, think about it. Like, Should I make one of them? Yeah, go you for can it. go for it. To the bar. But no, but uh, we we now have to have GPS trackers with us, and we have to have cell phones that can track us, and we have to have all of these location beacons. And you know, there's something. Why that, do we have to have that? Because you, we live in this era of like all of this technology. I mean, did you go to Alaska without a spot tracking device or a Garmin tracking device? I did not because I wanted to get airlifted out if a bear mauled me. That's my point. But like, what? Like, I guess for me, like, just this the sense of like you can you can do it without having to spend all of this extra money on something. You could get a paper map and in theory go take an adventure and, and have that. I think. Some of that's missing. I don't think that I carry a, a spot device too, so I'm not saying that I'm not trying to single you out for that. But yeah, you um, you cleared the expense report for that. Yeah, yeah. But my point <laughs> so is, is that like I think guy. that if you could bring some of that back, like it would okay. help. With, we have the modern technology. Yeah. It's good to have the the, the, the traction controls and the anti-lock brakes and the fuel injection. But just you, you can also just go get on your motorcycle and take a ride and have an adventure with a tent in the back, as long as you strap it on better than Zach did. <laughs> oh. Wow, that uh, left hook came out of nowhere. I didn't see that coming. Yeah. Holy Moses. Well, I'm glad that you, that you took a sharp turn there because you were this close to saying that social media is the problem with society now and you can't, you have to blah, 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 whap, whap, whap. No, I take a picture, it didn't happen. Very close, say though. That. <laughs> okay, we're doing so Instagram we, Live right now back there, so yeah. <laughs> Right, we love social media here at Revzilla. <laughs> All right, well, you know, uh, we, we, we defined eras. We gave opinions on what we thought the best one was, where we would like to go, and which era we'd like to ride in, why some eras sucked, why some were good. Anything, anything else we need, to, we need to cover here, we need to talk about? Felt like a pretty comprehensive conversation to me. I think I think we did great, and only half the audience left for those of you listening on yeah. the podcast. So, well, I it's interesting. So well. I saw I did see one of the comments come through on Instagram. They're like, not really much of a sold out crowd. We did limit because of uh, social distancing, so we actually kind of are almost sold out. But we wanted to make sure that we left <laughs> enough space for people to feel comfortable. So, High side, low side, yeah, yeah. kind of almost sold yeah, out. Yeah, that's that's our motto. <laughs> Right, right. Plus, it got really warm in here, so I wouldn't want any more bodies. True. There's a lot of, lot true, of breath. True. Okay, fair enough. So only, only the bodies watching on Instagram Live. All right. Well, I think um, it's time to pivot then to uh, high side, low side comments. Are you cool with that, Spurge? I am cool. I mean, but what we have to do is that we're going to do this a little bit differently for the live audience. Right. Um, we don't actually have... I don't know why there's comments written down oh, here. Oh, that's right. These are backups. Oh, no, those are, those are the backups. Those we're not reading them. Yeah, yeah. We weren't sure if, if the audience members were going to contribute, but apparently I was talking to producer Chase. Chase, our producer, we need you to come down to the stage for a second here. Um, so here's the way that and we did this. Hold on. As Chase comes up here, we definitely need a round yeah. of applause for Chase. He's the whole reason. He makes all this happen. That high side, low side is even a thing. Cool. cool. <laughs> so we, we got two envelopes. We've One labeled them good. good and maybe. <laughs> so um, we're not going to tell you what your comment is. <laughs> so the way that we're doing this for those of you watching at home is uh, we wanted to engage the audience a little bit. So we had a little box outside, and we asked you to put your questions and comments in. And normally, what we do is we have a meeting. Zach falls asleep, and then Chase and I figure out what comments we're going to read, and then we record the podcast, and Zach doesn't remember that we picked the comment. But now none of us know which comments are in here, because we haven't had a chance to, uh, to to read these ahead of time. We did have Chase proof them, though, so probably nothing. Yeah, hopefully, so, yeah. hopefully there's nothing well, really him, scary Knowing him, he here. might have left a few <laughs> zingers in there. Um, and there's, there's a lot of activity out there at the comments box. Right, right. Nice yeah. to see. So there's actually more in here. Let me, <laughs> while, while um, Faye Dunaway gets the Oscar card ready here, um, we will thank you so much if you uh, put a uh, comment in the in the bucket out there because you're you're allowing us to have fun with this. So thank you. What do we got? Is Ari going first? I think Ari can read this one if he wants to. Okay, uh, sure. I like to I like to read to myself first. I've learned this on Instagram Live. Like you got <laughs> you got to read the question yourself before you read. You're it halfway out through you and you're like, whoa, you're like, whoa, I can't say that. Yeah. Out well, loud. thankfully Chase proved yeah. this one. But this is uh, from uh, Derek. Derek, you here? Derek, in the crowd. Oh, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk to Derek beforehand. Yeah. All right. Came down Thanks, from the Bay Area, right? Why isn't and you said you put in four? You put in a lot, didn't you? Anyway. Oh, he's just going nuts, the, yeah. He loaded the dice. How many of these are Derek's, Chase? Did you edit these out? <laughs> Why isn't Gen Z taking to motorcycling? How can we get them into it? And then there's inside it says, thoughts on starting a TikTok account. 
Wow. What's TikTok? <laughs> that's probably Brandon Wise's department if we're going to yeah, have the youngster of the group uh, start anything. That's a, that's a big question to tackle. Well, I read it, so you can tackle it. <laughs> I have. I, I don't have anything intelligent to say about TikTok aside from you're probably right. We should probably do that. Um, why isn't Gen Z taking to motorcycling? I think. Well, you're, you're ready well to I feel like that. I'm maybe I'm just having deja vu, but this is a topic you've discussed before, right? Or at least we've had conversations about. Maybe you've done, <laughs> you guys have done a lot of these, but I I will venture out on a limb. Getting Gen Z to do it, as I understand it, they seem to be opposed to danger and risk, and as we all know, motorcycles can be a little risky. Interesting, interesting take. Yeah, there's certainly a population of people, and maybe this is who you're talking about, Derek, not totally sure, but you know, uh, uh, young people who live in urban, uh, densely populated areas that are adverse to getting driver's licenses at all. They take public transit, they take Uber, they don't have any, is this, am I on the right, am I on the right track here? He's shaking no, his he's head. shaking his head. Yeah, there's also like bike life kids, you know, so. Okay, okay. All right, all right. Well, you're contradicting yourself because they're into motorcycling, are they not? Or is that not the right kind of motorcycling? Not the yeah, right and, kind. And okay, so Derek's got very high standards. Bike, for his he, he, he made the comment that Derek made was uh, the, the, the bike life right. thing that we're seeing in a lot of the, the, uh, the urban areas right now. And right. there's actually a really good article on Common Tread uh, about this, this whole well, phenomenon. It's really good. But it's what's, what's the bike so, that you just rode from Honda? Great question and great segue, Spurgeon. I rode a bike called the Honda Navi, um, which is essentially a 110cc scooter that Honda has uh, kind of dressed up as a motorcycle. Uh, I'm sure if anyone from Honda were here, they would hate me saying that, but that's kind of what it is. But uh, in some ways, it's designed for, uh, I mean, it's really designed for everybody, in my opinion, but it's, it's certainly, uh, it has a bent toward people who have never ridden before, and they're not sure, they, they don't want to ride a scooter per se, but they needed the bike to be easy to use, and, and that's very twist much what this is. Twist and, and go, no, trans yeah, no, no gears, exactly. Very, very small, affordable. Extremely cheap, 1,800 bucks. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of thing that hopefully, yeah. I think this is where you're going with it, hopefully yeah. would would uh, get people to think like, oh man, like I could spend $600 on a bird scooter and do that, yeah. or like, ah, oh, I could get this thing and then I could, have, I could be a motorcycle, so I could ride a motorcycle, and I don't know. Derek, we were actually having this conversation before before we set up today for High Side Low Side because Zach just rode, rode that and he has to write about it. And that was my <laughs> suggestion to him was like, I'm excited about that bike because it is an access point for people who don't. They're, they've never ridden a motorcycle before. They just need cheap transportation that's going to be super reliable and get incredible miles per gallon. And like, it's a device to them, but it gets them on two wheels. It gets them into the thrill of twisting the throttle and, and accelerating. So I think, honestly, bikes like that. Because when we went to Mexico a few years ago and rode those Italicas right. that we bought at a department store for 700 bucks, like we said then, we're like, we need this in America because right. then you just have access and people aren't getting into it because they're like, bikes are cool. They're getting into it because they need cheap transportation. Right. And, and that's, ex that, that's exactly where I was going with this. So <laughs> I recently, um, my brother doesn't ride a motorcycle. I have two younger brothers, um, but I took a Super 70. What are their names? Joshua and Jimmy. My, my parents did not repeat Another my Another curveball. Yeah. Yeah. Joshua oh, there's and Jimmy. so many variations of Spurgeon that they could have done. But they didn't. They went Joshua Spur and Jimmy. Jonas. Uh, this was <laughs> Joshua. This was my middle brother. That's what you're going to name your kid. So Joshua, uh, I took a Super 73 home for him, and he got on it. He's, he's had no interest in ever riding a motorcycle, and he's like, I want to get one of these. He's a high school teacher, and he has like a five-mile commute. He's like, I'm going to go back and forth to the, to the school on this. So the problem with that is that you start looking at electric bicycles, and that, I think, could be an amazing solution for Generation Z. I think it already is. You're seeing people riding electric bicycles that wouldn't have otherwise turned to motorcycling. But the cost is prohibitive. You look at some of these electric bicycles, and they're 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 more than motorcycles. Yeah, in some Super case. seventy three, like thirty five hundred bucks. It's like okay. for for like the, up to the, the top ones. Sure. But like that's why I'm looking at that that Honda that you rode. You're starting to see something that's sub two thousand dollars. It looks like a Grom, but it's easier to ride. And I think that is right. what the solution is because not everybody wants to learn how to use a clutch. We all do because we <laughs> like it. Right. But not everybody does. Sure. Not so. Not to steal the last word, but. Uh, sorry, would you like to? Continue? I was just going to say that we both rode to the top of Alaska without clutches. True enough. There you go. Wow. Yeah. Just so um, lazy. So, uh, but I mean, so Honda, but not, Honda sells, I mean, how many of their gold wings are DCT? Yeah. Like 40, 40, 50% 50 of their gold wings. How else are you supposed to more, TikTok and ride? <laughs> if you can't just more let than, it right. you got to have a free hand. If, if, there's I'm not, ever, if, if I'm using the clutch. If there's ever been a Gen Z bike, it's a gold wing. Well, not to steal the last <laughs> word, but, but, but I would love to bring it back around to... Um, to the sort of core of what I feel like Derek's question was, so we can move on. I think to what you said about you know the bike life uh, movement, uh, you know, um, you know, 
Any, what I was going to say about that is it reminds me of a, a conversation I had with an interview that I did with a guy named Miguel Galuzzi, who uh, designed the Ducati Monster and currently works for Piaggio, uh, Aprilia Moto Guzzi, designing motorcycles. And I, I had a conversation with him one time about people who just sort of like dabble in, motorcycle as, dabble in motorcycles as a lifestyle thing. Like, oh, they just want to look cool. They don't really care about motorcycling. And isn't that bad? And his outlook was, no. Anybody who gets on a motorcycle and tries it is great. There is no wrong way to do it. You should just try because then you're hooked and then you'll be a part of the community and hopefully you'll grow into, you know, uh, being a lifelong motorcyclist. So I think that's a very optimistic, maybe too optimistic, but I think that's an optimistic take from a guy who's been around the industry a long time and I think that's a, a good way to look I at it. So I try to have an open mind. I think you're an optimistic individual and I think now the audience <laughs> knows that. Um, All right, what's so next? I would like to go to, uh, uh, this is from Robbie. Robbie? Oh my gosh, we've got so many people in the center. front row. I mean, it kind of makes sense. I the feel ones like that are submitting planned. questions yeah. are like yeah. <laughs> super so, fans. Robbie says, what do you think of the direction Harley is taking with their new revolution bikes, like the Sportster S and the Pan America? He also then goes on to ask a second question, which I will save. Because it's like a little <laughs> okay. sub-question. But what do you think of the Sportster S and the Pan America? We're just talking about the engines? They're great engines. Super yeah. impressive. Right. Like we 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 both ridden. Robbie both said bikes. yes, yes. So the answer to his <laughs> we we we're just talking about the engines of these bikes. Yeah. Like what do we think about them? Go ahead. Yeah, they're they're impressive. I mean, you've got variable valve timing. You've got hydraulic lifters. So you never have to adjust them. The horsepower and performance is fantastic. Um, what else am I forgetting? It's got like magnesium cases. I mean, it just yeah. they blew super the clutch. lid off their own design ethos, which was super impressive. Which was which was frankly necessary to a certain extent. Maybe Long this is what you're reaching for. But yeah, like they it, they. Uh, Harley Davidson has produced a modern, uh, technologically advanced, compact, powerful, um, state of the art engine, which is kind of what it needed to do. But one of the things I was talking about in the, we, we had a little reception area and we were answering some questions and having some great conversations. And one of the, the topics that come up in conversation is that it's not the same as traditional Harley engines in the way they make their power. So if you're coming off of, uh, Street Glide, yep. and it makes you know peak torque at 1500 RPM, and then you get on one of the new Revolution engines, you're going to be very surprised because <laughs> it really doesn't start to make its power until like 5500 RPM. So it's very m much more European uh, sport bike like in that sense. I believe the word you're looking for is modern. Modern. Yeah. So, but it is some. It is something to note. So I think that there's a lot of people, and I've heard them say where it's like, well, I I want to ride an adventure bike, but I also I want to ride a Harley Davidson. Um, and if you're trying to get on that V twin and have it and think that you're going to get the same experience, it isn't. It's it's definitely more um, aggressive and modern in its approach. And I think that this is a challenge for Harley Davidson and one that it needs to take on pretty seriously, which is, you know abandoning or or pushing aside the faithful who have learned to love Harley Davidson over the past number of decades. This is a big shift, right? This is a big thing that arguably needs to be done, whether it's emissions or or to prove that they can, it can be a modern company. Yeah, to be competitive it, with the other brands right, out there. It has to happen. And I think there have been a few stabs in the past, but I feel like at this point the the you know they've made the the touring bikes and the and the other more classic Harley models uh, They've they've made them modern in technology, if not in appearance and and power delivery, and this is the next logical step. They have to do it. And the most impressive thing about it, in my opinion, is that they did. Is they that, did is it that, well? Yeah, yeah they, they did well. It's, it's not in. perfect, I mean, but it's an but excellent, it's a, excellent. It's engine. a great engine. I'm going to take Robbie's question one step further, though, and go beyond just the powertrain. I was <laughs> disappointed um, that we didn't get the Bronx, and I feel like they came out with the Pan America. I was at the launch. Explain to the ladies and gentlemen what the so, Bronx was. So yeah, the Bronx was going to be the, the the partner bike for the Pan America. If you were at IMS in 2019, you saw a Harley Davidson Pan America and you saw a Harley Davidson Bronx. It was a smaller engine, a 950, but same same V twin design, slightly less power. Riding in a, in, a naked, in a naked bike. In a naked, like a naked, in a naked, street a naked street bike. A like, bike. Yeah, a naked sport bike. Sorry about that. Um, but after riding the Pan America, I went into the Pan America launch, and one of my friends works at Harley Davidson, and he was like, "You're gonna love it." I'm like, uh, "We'll see." Um, and I, and it was a great bike. I enjoyed riding it. It was easier to ride than some of the other bikes out there. Um, there were a lot of uh, of great steps forward, but then they followed it up with the Sportster S, which kind of was like, "Well, we don't want to go too far. We kind of want to play it safe a little bit." Um, and I would have much rather have seen them follow that bike up with the Bronx, which would have kept the actual complete design moving forward and more modern. And it would have allowed them to 
retain the Sportster, which is fine as is. It might not have True. met emissions. It was still an air-cooled engine. But if they'd gone Bronx, they could have done something totally different, whereas what they did with the Sportster is not really... They, they played it safe. They played it safe. The so engine's, safe. The engine's great, but the bike itself is not, as a complete product, not great. I, I Again, not to steal the last word, but to bring it back to the eras of motorcycling topic that we had today, I do feel, and I said this in my <coughs> YouTube program, Daily Rider, if anyone watches it, um, I, I feel like the Sportster... Uh, when it came out in late 50s, I think 59, maybe the f f first Sportster, it was sort of a, it was a regular motorcycle. But before a lot of the splits in in in, uh, in types of motorcycles had happened, and if you had a fast Harley Sportster in 1965 or something like that, you had a fast bike. It was it was it was mean. I have a very strange factoid: 14.3 second quarter mile. Harry Henning, ladies that's, and gentlemen. That's, is that your time? 14th. No, that's what a, a 1200cc Harley Sportster would do in the late 60s. That was right. a fast bike in the right. late 60s. So it gives 14, you an idea. SV650 will do like a 13 flat. Right. <laughs> so it gives you an idea how far we've come as far as performance is concerned. But the point is, that bike was like, it was a, it was a mean machine on the streets, you know? And, and the new Sportster... Oh, I, not what I would have done, and like you know, I agree the Bronx would have been more exciting, and um, I appreciate that the that Harley reached for that thing because the new Sportster is not just fast for Harley; it's like pretty fast. I mean, it's 120 horsepower or something like that. Like it, yeah. it'll it'll blow your hair back, which yeah. I think is uh is 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 arguably to reach back to the original you know sort of plan of the bike makes sense. So Robbie's follow up question to this was. Would you guys re ride a uh, King of the Baggers bike? Would you go out? And oh hell yeah! Have yeah. others? We'll yeah. race. Yeah. Absolutely. I was actually supposed to. I was supposed to race one at. Um, That's right. Uh, up in no, Salt Lake City. At Miller. Yeah, yeah, yeah Miller. Right. It was for a performance machine, but we we went to Alaskan State, which was better. <laughs> but yeah, definitely, we will we will we will race whatever would, has just wheels. To, just to say that you did it, I think would sure, be kind of sure. cool, Absolutely. right? Would Would you ride one? Yeah. He says yes. Robbie says yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Right on. All right. What's um, next, Burge? Tyler C. says, what is the best bike and why is it a V-Strom? I just wanted to read that out loud. This is clearly my dad is somewhere in the audience. Right on. All Tyler, right. I'm not even going to bother answering that question. Not going to do it. That's, that's one for Spurgeon Senior. Best You're welcome. Best bike and why is it a V-Strom? Do you guys have an opinion? This, this actually ties into uh, Jeremy's question. We got Jeremy. Jeremy, right here. So Jeremy. Jeremy wrote, "What is what's worth testing at IMS?" So that kind of ties in with oh, Tyler's okay. question of like, "What's the best bike out there right now?" Jeremy wants to know what's worth riding at IMS. If you could only pick one bike to to test ride at IMS, and this is the uh, International Motorcycle Show. Nice. Is that what it is? Yeah. But it's just in America, right? Whoops. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, the, the big thing with IMS is taking a shift this year. It's outdoors. It's, it's locally. It's right down the street. Um, if you guys are in from out of town, go check it out because there's supposedly fleets and fleets of, of motorcycles you can actually test ride. So that's where this question is coming from. So what would you say? Zach, why don't you go first? What? I'm going first? Yeah. Well, I'll stall by saying... Because you've the, been getting the last word in for all these <laughs> other comments. So why don't you get the first word in? Zach. Um, I, I'll just stall for a minute by saying, do they have an IMS show in Toronto? Or in Quebec or anything? They do. They do. All right. There we go. Yeah, they do cross Crossing the border. Crossing over the Canadian border. border. <laughs> Watch out for the mosquitoes. Um, yeah. So the the one bike to try. Um, 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 oh, my God. Do you have a good answer? Well, Play I don't want to sound like a broken record because we've already been talking about it with the Pan America. That's probably the oh, biggest okay. seismic shift. All right. All right. That's yeah. the bike that's going to be the most interesting and the most different from anything that came before. Would you say sports or two? Or no? Just Pan America. No, I don't ride the sports. Just Pan America. Yeah. All, right. All right. Well, that's, that's, that's your answer. That's how you really feel. What about you? What, what do you say? I gave this to you first. No. I, don't. Yes. I think I already answered, didn't I? Stop it. <laughs> Sounds like a political debate up here sometimes. <laughs> Stop it. That's um, why you're here in the middle. You're the mediator. All right. Well, I'm, I'm panicking because I can't think of anything. Well, it's like, uh, no. We haven't been. We're going tomorrow. And we don't, True. Know, we don't necessarily know what's there. Yeah. Yeah. What was his name? Livewire. Livewire. Oh, okay, we got we got a shout out for Livewire. Yeah, that's well, a so separate brand at this point. Harley Davidson has split the Livewire off as its own brand. Uh, but I think that's a good point as far as like getting a chance to ride an electric motorcycle, because um, I think it I think for folks that have never ridden an electric bike before, it's definitely an experience that I that I think you should all try, because um, it it is completely different than what you expect. I rode uh, what's the electric KTM the Freeride. Yeah. Yeah. And the first time that I wrote that, I mean, it's, there was no, the levers were different and there was no <laughs> foot brake on it. And it's just like, it's, it's a completely different experience, but then it's also like smack you in the face torque sure. right out of the gate. The live wire is a, a good motorcycle all around, in my opinion. I mean, I, I, I only, I've only ridden it for a short period of time, but that, that certainly w w could change your opinion of, of electric bikes if you have an opportunity. So it sounds like you need to go to the Harley tent. 
Pan America and Livewire, this is the only thing. Was, I don't you know, probably I weren't expecting that from us, right? <laughs> that was probably the last bike that you expected us to say. I, know, I mean, like, it, there's a lot of bikes to ride. Um, I, I agree. I think that, you know, it was interesting because I came back from the Pan America press ride and I called my dad and I was like, I found the bike for you. Because my dad's a little bit shorter and he likes to lower his bikes. He likes a V-Strom. And I was like, well, this is kind of something that you, you could, you know, with the, with the adaptive ride height, it's worth checking out. That's one of the features that we really haven't talked about. It works really well. Um, I like that answer. I think that's a good answer. Let's yeah, move on then. Yeah. yeah what, what's next? Uh, we don't need to focus on the fact we that Sean's I never answered the question. Sean's? Sure. Uh, reading Sean's question. Sean, you out there still? Sean? How many There's a Sean. There he is. This is right. your question. Okay. Uh, sometimes you shouldn't go into a career if it's something you enjoy doing. What do you guys, gals, feel about this? Wow. That's heavy. Yeah, that is. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's an important question. How How that was a good envelope. Yeah. Yeah. Who's, who's taking this first? Am I taking this first? <laughs> I feel like, yeah, go for guest, it. Guest honors? No, no, no. I, I no. <laughs> well, Sean. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> and uh, it is, it is, a, it is a, a, a tough thing to a certain extent. I mean, obviously we do this because we love it. And I don't think that any of us would, would, train, would, would trade this for um, hammer nails or flipping burgers or, or brokering stocks Banking. or whatever. Yeah, no. um, uh, so, you know, it, it, you do get to have a lot of fun. But it, it, the interesting uh, dynamic that I usually explain to people uh, is that I often find myself enjoying a weekend without motorcycles which is kind of strange. I, it took a long time in my life to get there, but I will go to uh, you know, a, a dinner party at the in-law's house or something like that, and if I get through the whole evening and, and I don't talk about motorcycles, I actually think like, oh, it's kind of fun to not, you know, to, to talk to people about what they do for a living or where they travel or that kind of thing, um, which, which sort of, uh, I guess, breaks my heart a little bit uh, to, to think about that kind of, uh, that shift, but at the end of the day, it mean it's be, it's only because I get to spend uh, you know no fewer than five days a week hanging out with people that I like, luckily, and and getting to spend my time focusing on something that I truly care about. So really, at the end of the day, I wouldn't. Just so I'm clear, you men you, you were motioning at Ari and not me, right? With the people both, I like, both yeah. of you. Obviously. No, yeah. I I like both of no, you. No, but equally. I no. So that's a really good point. But I will say that the flip side of that is that. On those, you know, off weekends where you're like, man, this was really nice to sit and, you know, go to the aquarium um, and, and not think about bikes. There's then, like, the next week where you're standing in the middle of the desert with, uh, you know, a dirt bike and two of your friends. And you're like, I can't believe I get to, to do this. <laughs> and so, like, the flip sure, side sure. is that there are these monumental moments where you're in situations where you wouldn't get to do it if it weren't for, you know, what we were doing at, at certain points in time. It, it's a, it's, it's not, it's a double-edged sword for sure. But, um, but you have a great line that you always say when people say, what's it like to have a dream job? Yeah. And it's not my line. I, I couched it from Brian Catterson, who is my editor at Motorcyclist. But he says one day a month, it's a dream job. It's the best job in the world. And the rest of the time, it's just a job. But even saying that, if it's just a job and you're sitting at a desk typing, you get to type about motorcycles. You get to type about something you're interested in, which I still feel fortunate about. Even when I'm like grinding on something, I'm like, it's still something I am very passionate about. Um, but I have recommended to a lot of people who are like, oh, I want to do what you do. I want to be in the industry. We we are kind of like, we get tossed about by the wind and like whenever the press launches are, are going on or whenever the video is due. I've often encouraged people to like get a good job and then <laughs> get a real job, then, everybody. Well, honestly, you can go I mean, buy motorcycles. Yeah, and then buy enjoy all. enjoy motorcycling on your own terms. Like we get to do a bunch of really cool stuff, right, right. but like it's also work. Like when we, when we go to Alaska, we have to film their long days and I'm not complaining about it. I'm just saying like, it's different than if we were just like, we're going to go to Alaska on our own and take a road trip together. I think that's really important to understand. And I, I was something that I touched on in the KLR 650 video, um, briefly, or maybe it got cut out. I don't remember. Spencer edited that one <laughs> or Stephen Gregory edited that one. Um, but you know, we are oftentimes on those videos, spending so much time trying to make sure the GoPro battery didn't die, or that we're saying the things we need to say, or we have to go redo this one section of road um, because we have to, you know, get this other piece of, of footage again. So the, the times that I enjoy motorcycling the most are when I'm out on the weekends with my friends on a ride, or I'm going to do a, a, a dirt bike race. Um, you know, Brandon and I will go do Hammer Run, or Jen came out the, the one time we all went and rode dirt bikes together. And like, those are the moments where there's not cameras and there's not the job and there's not the article you have to write. Much like the way all of you enjoy motorcycling, that's the best part. Um, and I will say the best part of this job is not motorcycling. The best part of this job, and I, and I genuinely mean that, is that we get 
to work with an amazing team. The reason that this production is going on tonight is that we have, not you, um, <laughs> we have, I mean, we, we joke about Chase the producer, um, you know, but everybody that you see behind the scenes, behind that curtain back there, I get to work with every single day and we get to work with our best friends. And, and it, it really is, we have this group of like 17 people at Revzilla that are the video team and we, uh, we couldn't be more fortunate that we get to hang out with these people every day. Or we don't get out much and they're our only friends yeah. in general. Yeah. So ipso facto, they're our best friends. One or the other. <laughs> but um, anyway, moving on. Yeah, what's the next question? So, that, that was a good one. Well said, that. Yeah. So let's move on. So we're going to, I do want to, we have a little how bit of time many, left. How many of these are we going to do, by the way? Well, we got a little bit of time okay. left. Sure. Should, yeah. should we do some more or does anybody want to okay. leave? More? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good, good. So this is from uh, Brandon. Brandon Stahl? Is that the Brandon? There he is, right here. Oh, all right. Oh, you came with the producer. Yeah, all right. Look at her. Um, Thank you. Brandon. <laughs> and the, the, Vistram, yeah, the yellow Vistram out there between uh, two roses. Um, Brandon, <laughs> Brandon says, what music is everyone, uh, Zilla crew, listening to the most on their rides lately? Oh, I like this question. Yeah, I bet you do. What would you say? Do you I bet you do. Do you listen to music when you ride? I do, yeah, yeah. actually. That's interesting. Uh, so, I, I was a big advocate of like, I don't want a comm system. I want to just enjoy the sure. experience of motorcycling. Yeah. And then I got a comm system. I'm like, this is great. Yeah. <laughs> um, Where I did you been... find a reasonably priced comm system, Spurgeon Dunbar? There's a website that I like to go to. <laughs> all, no, right, all right, all right. Do you have, so do either of you ride with music or am I the only one? I don't ride with music. No, I, never I don't. Have. I, 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 um, yeah, I got an answer like for you. down, Brandon. <laughs> I, I, have a, I, I struggle a little bit because the time that I want to ride with music is when I'm on like open road, like freeway. I would listen to music then perhaps, but it's often loud and, you, and I can't hear especially well, unless you're on like a really like a big touring bike that has really, really good wind protection. And riding at slow speed, you can hear the music a little bit better, but that's normally when you're in an urban environment, you're in traffic, traffic lights. So I don't like to listen to music then because I like to try to be a little more alert in, in those situations. So it's kind of like, it's a catch 22 that I find myself in. Um, and to be honest, I mostly listen to like um, news radio, uh, but NPR or, like, or like podcasts or something like that. We have a pretty short like commute, I'm... so we'll listen to the news in the morning just like, because yeah. it's, a, it's a good time to listen to that it and get caught so up. That sounds so boring. <laughs> it's, easier, it's easier to hear and I catch up on what's going on in the world. So, I don't know, I, 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 I apologize. I can tell you what music I've been listening to in general, but <laughs> it's not what I'm writing, I apologize. Um, so Brandon, I'll answer your question. I, first of all, I don't listen to music when I ride off-road. Off-road, I don't have any comm systems in my helmet. I don't like, I, I, that's not my thing. But for like riding on the street, I absolutely, I, I like music. And actually a lot of the music that we were spinning through here was a, a, a Spotify playlist that I had built out for Get On Adventure Fest that we've done this past hold year. Hold on, hold on, hold on. All that classic rock? Uh, you were making no, fun some of me for mentioning no, no, ACDC and some Queen? Th that was Chase's stuff. Chase went heavy on the classic oh, oh. rock. I was throwing in some, <laughs> Under some the different bus, stuff. Chase yeah. goes. Um, but one of the, one of the, there was like two or three songs in there off of the new Black Keys record. Um, so Black Keys have a, a new record out where they actually did a bunch of, uh, of old blues covers. Um, and they actually got a bunch of these, these blues players from the South to, to come up. And it was like real Mississippi Delta stuff, but done in a more modern, funky sense. Great record to, to, to ride to. Given book recommendations and music yeah. recommendations. But, uh, but is it's there funny anything this man I drive, I drive Lance Oliver crazy because I'll try to, if I write an article, I'm like, I'm going to make it like a music article with some motorcycling. And Lance is like, listen, I need a motorcycle article with some music in it. Um, but like, yeah, it's like, Give Me Some Water by Eddie Money was one of the songs that was on there. And like when I was in Mexico, it was a great song because he's, he's like, he's like stealing a horse in Mexico and then they catch him and they hang him. And I'm like, that's, that's what I want to listen to when I'm riding. So that's, that's that Spurgeon's <laughs> ideal vacation. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so adventure. I would say I, I could, we could talk more afterwards, but uh, <laughs> the new, the new Black Keys record is a great one to listen to while you're riding. At least you got one good answer yeah. there, um, Brandon. Yeah. All right. Ooh, all right. This, this question is from Ral. Ral? 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 Right on. Okay. Um, what do you predict? Did I say your name right, by the way? Yeah, Ral. Okay, right on. Ral. Um, Ral asks, what do you predict will be the next major technology innovations to come to motorcycles? The next ma Are you guys paying attention? No. You have no, something no, on no, the no, again? <laughs> Son of a gun. We're having a side conversation right, over here. Right, okay. You're talking about what beer you're going to order? Um, so what do you predict guys, what do you predict will be the next major technology innovation to come to motorcycles or innovations? Anything? Hover, Hover bikes. bikes. <laughs> <laughs> next Nailed question. It. Yes. <laughs> we um, brought it back around. We could probably end on that one and be, be in a good spot. <laughs> 
Uh, I think to, to give your to give your your question a little bit more serious answer, I think the what I usually do is look to the world of cars, look to automotive. That's that's usually where uh, technologies um, kind of blossom and so uh, self driving. Yeah, perhaps. Well, they've done that. Did we see the video of the BMW GS that could ride by Terrifies itself and put me. the kickstand down? No, very we, we, we talked about trying to race it for a CTXB episode. We did. We did. <laughs> we wanted to race against it. I don't think BMW was into it. Anyway, um, uh, I, I think that you know, not not every piece of car technology is is feasible or, or realistic in the motorcycle world. But I do think that that kind of thing is where you know, it's where uh, active semi-active suspension came from. Um, I don't know, airbags to a certain extent, ABS. Um, that Goldwing so, airbag is really catching on. Really catching on. Just so for, for those of you who didn't listen to that episode, Spurgeon didn't know that there was an, a Goldwing with an airbag, in it, right? You, no, that was not what happened. <laughs> I, that was, I was the one that was like, this is the dumbest thing. Because like, you have to like pay a premium. I'm like, no. Yeah, so I was okay, the one that was like anti-airbags on Goldwing. Spurgeon Dunbar doesn't do safety. Oh, no, we got the voice in. Right, right. Um, so yeah, I, don't, I guess I can't think of anything off the top of my head that really seems, you know, we, we've got like CarPlay, I guess. So maybe there'll be like motorcycle play. I think um, electric they bikes. Car, they have car play on bikes. Yeah, the, car play on bikes. Car play, but it's not, Let's get back to the it's not great. Though. I think adaptive, adaptive cruise control. It's already in motorcycle. Right, right. Like we talked yeah, about the, the multi-strata. That's the next frontier. And it's one of those ones when I heard about it, I was like, really? No way. And then I tried it. I was like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's Actually, Raul, Raul, you have a multi-strata. With adaptive cruise, yes, yes he does. So he's and how do you how do you like? How often do you nap while you ride? <laughs> two th you're only holding one thumb up, though. There <laughs> we go. Large. All right, so we have two thumbs up for adaptive cruise control, which is why Raul wants to know the answer to this question because he already has such a cutting edge bike. He wants to know what's next. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you one 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 last answer here. I learned recently that there is a Honda PCX160 scooter that is sold in Thailand that is a hybrid. And I think that that may be the next thing that we... I mean, we Kawasaki's already got that. They say they yeah, do. It's not you guys really are getting 110 me. miles per gallon on a Trail 125. Maybe we just all get Trail 125s. Maybe. Put some adaptive Maybe. cruise control on a Trail 125, <laughs> and we call that the future. The next there you frontier. Go. You heard it here first, Ralph. So this is going to be the last question. I'm, 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 we're going to, because yeah. we want to... Because we're getting thirsty. Everybody, yeah, there's a bar yeah. next door, and we want to all go drink with you guys. <laughs> um, I'm going to... How would you pronounce that name? Oh, K-M-P-H. Kumpf? Is that it? Oh, Kumpf. Yeah, we, we, we talked earlier. How, say, say it for us. Krunal, but I, I just abbreviated as kilometers per hour. Oh, uh, kilometers per clever. hour. Clever. Yeah, yeah. okay. Gotcha. We should fooled us, though. Such ugly Americans. So we this like, is I a, don't know what kilometers are. <laughs> this is a question that I'm going to ask the two of you. So earlier this year, Ari and Zach, with Spencer's help, uh, <laughs> shot an episode of CTXP where they built, recreated, and rode a mini bike from Nebraska to Colorado to recreate the Dumb and Dumber mini bike scene. We did. If you haven't seen it, it's a must watch on YouTube. Um, the question is, what is the best memory for the two of you from the Dumb and Dumber ride? And it has to be an off camera moment. Oh, it has to be off camera? It has, it has, to, be to, be has to be an off, be off camera. camera moment. Oh, okay. You want to take it? <laughs> It's pretty easy because uh, it's, I'm sad we didn't get it on camera. Right. Okay. Uh, well, you go first. Uh, what was the name of town? Walden, Colorado, 62 miles from, from anywhere, anywhere, according yeah. to the waitress at Walden, the bar. Colorado. We got up in the morning. We had breakfast. We had to shoot the scene where we like left town, and so we were getting on the bike, and we we had to go up and down this little main street, and it's a very rural town, just a couple of buildings on each side, and we had to do it a couple times because Spencer's got to get his shots from different angles. Um, the real prima donna. And the police came up and basically pulled us over, and they're like, "You can't." You can't ride that here. You, what are you doing? And we're like, no, no, no. It's got a license plate. Louis showed him the Arizona plate. Yeah, we're and like, he we walked around register. the back of it and looked at it. And he's like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> and it's and, a question we get a lot for all different aspects <laughs> yeah, of what sure. we do and, from our loved ones. And yeah. we said we were riding it to Aspen. And the cops, the two cops, like light bulbs, stood back and like, and the one guy's like, where the beer flows like wine. <laughs> And then they were like, great. They were just yeah. like, and, and everyone was firing quotes every Oh, yeah. And the other guy second. was like, and the women flock like the yeah. salmon of Capistrano. The, didn't they run the plate? Yeah, they, they ran the plate. They, they, they were the not that friendly. <laughs> and um, then other than that, I don't have many memories because of the exhaust poisoning. <laughs> um, well, I guess um, this is, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm torn about sharing this, to be honest with you, because I, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like a little bit of a jerk, but... There's only 150 of your closest friends here. <laughs> I know. You, I, you can do I, this. I'm, I'm not easily embarrassed, so I'm very curious. Yeah, well, um, we... Um, I got a message from a, 
uh, this is maybe a couple weeks after the video was published, and I got a message from someone in uh, customer service at Revzilla, oh, yeah. and he said, I just got a really weird phone call. Um, some guy called, and he says that he works for Peter Farrelly. Um, of the Farrelly that, brothers. Of the Farrelly brothers, who made Dumb and Dumber. And he said, he wants, they want to get in touch with you for something. And um, I said, okay, we'll forward the email. And I went downstairs, and I told Arian Spencer, and we all said, Oh Jesus, we're getting sued. We're getting sued. A hundred percent. Cease and desist. Here no question. To the, the point where we had, like, like they, we had to like check with our legal department, and we're like, no, we oh, checked with the legal department before we did the episode, and they said it wasn't a good idea. And <laughs> yeah, someone, that's what you're saying. Yeah, someone, someone, anyway. someone, honestly, we tried to do this at the previous right. company we worked at. We've been wanting to do this show, this episode for six years, years and yeah. the previous company was like, absolutely not. It's too risky. Right. And the lawyers at Revzilla said, or Komodo said the same thing, <laughs> but our our superior was like, you guys need to do this. Right. It needs to happen. So they had faith in us, which is great. Right. So. So we get this email and we're like, oh boy, we're crashing and burning so hard here. We are in so much trouble. Um, to shorten the rest of the story, uh, Peter and Bobby Farrelly, who made the movie, saw the episode and they told us that they loved it and they wanted to be on a Zoom call. We got on a Zoom call and uh, we were on the Zoom call with Peter Farrelly, Bobby Farrelly, Jim Carrey, and Jeff Daniels. And they all said, we saw the episode, it was so cool. And we, and we got to talk to him for like 20 minutes and it was the most... Uh, surreal and yeah. ridiculous. But, but, how did, but how did Jim Carrey yeah, present himself? Jim Carrey came in late and he just had the blank screen and there's some sort of wood facade in the background. I don't know if it was his house or a library or what. And he rose into frame over the course of like <laughs> 35 seconds so slowly and he just had that like crazy look on his face. And like I think that was something I learned in that in that conversation is like the Jim Carrey you see on screen is like, like he can't that's him like, pretty much pretty much how he seems to be so yeah and Spencer uh, our our esteemed um, producer and director who you met before went to film school and and you know like he said has always dreamed of having something that he made on a big screen uh, so to get to talk to actual famous Hollywood types was was super surreal and super amazing that they saw it and they actually clapped us on the back um, so that's my favorite memory from yeah that I feel episode. like those are those yeah. are good examples. There you go. I think that's a. I think that's a, that's a good way to that's end. a high note to, to wrap things up. I want to thank everybody for showing up for our first ever high side, low side live. Uh, if you were a t-shirt winner or again someone that dated my father in the seventies, please go <laughs> ahead and shoot us an email. We'll make sure you get your t-shirts. And uh, yeah, any, anything else you need to add, Harry? Um, we've got. Uh, we're gonna go next door to the Native Sun, little local bar. If uh, anyone's if got anybody time. else wants to come over and buy us a beer, we gave you we, free popcorn. We've been so working, <laughs> so we have to have any beers, so we're going to go get them now. To come back to and your I question, like she was Sean, right? We're working right now, Friday night. It's brutal. Are you yeah. kidding me? Um, so yeah, uh, uh, special thanks to, to the whole production crew from Revzilla. Uh, they love tequila shots, so please buy them <laughs> one. Um, and we'll see you guys in season five. Thank you so much for hanging out tonight. <laughs>